Hello and welcome to lecture five on William Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. And I'm sure you've heard the phrase, the expression, the best laid plans of mice and men often get thrown in the garbage. And I was hoping to get all these lectures online by Monday, by tomorrow at the latest, but I may need an extra day. I may not have uh, the last lecture up until uh, Tuesday, but that should still allow you enough time to complete your journals and uh, your exams, your midterm journals and your midterm exams. But if it isn't, don't panic. Just let me know if you need a one or two day extension and that's fine. We're flexible. So today, um, before we begin, I was thinking about the problem of the other mind, that philosophical problem we've been discussing um, that arises in A Midsummer Night's Dream. And you know, I mentioned that the most frightening aspect of this problem is that uh, we don't have access to other people's thoughts and feelings and that doesn't give us an accurate view of the real world and so it can become quite dangerous not knowing what the reality is around us. And uh, so we can't know for absolutely, it's not an absolute certainty. We can't know for sure, can we, what others are thinking and feeling. But then I thought maybe there's something even more disturbing. Imagine that we did have access to other people's thoughts, what they were truly thinking about us, what they were truly feeling. Um, and I was reminded of an episode from the television series Gilligan's Island. I was raised in the 60s and that was a very popular show uh, in my childhood. And there was one episode where Gilligan, uh, you remember the castaways, they're stranded on a, an island somewhere in the Pacific, and Gilligan, who is the first mate, uh, and, uh, you know, he's, uh, uh, um, he's, he's a, a kind of bottom, a lovable bottom. Um, and uh, one day he's exploring the, uh, uh, the jungle on the island, and he comes across a bush that has tiny little seeds, and when he eats one of the seeds, he discovers that he can read the other castaways thoughts and, and uh, he can listen in on their feelings and eventually they all want to eat the seeds and when they do uh, at first it, you know they're so excited uh, to be able to read other people's minds uh, what others are thinking and feeling but then it turns really dark and rather nasty rather ugly when they discover what others truly think about them and how others truly feel. And uh, that might be even more frightening. I mean, I don't know if I want to have access to other people's minds. Would you, would you really want to know what other people think about you or how other people feel about you? So anyway, I was thinking about that. Um, and I was, I was also thinking about um, uh, the Amazons, you know, Hippolyta and her Amazons, and they too are kind, they, if you will, they are uh, shapeshifters, aren't they? I mean, they too metamorphose, they reject the patriarchal order, and when they do, they, uh, as I said earlier, they assume the traditional roles of, uh, one of the traditional roles of, uh, uh, of men, and that is the role of the soldier. Uh, remember, the military is, is uh, an institution that is run by men. Uh, so they, in a sense, don't they? They begin to shape shift and become more and more male. And also, uh, physically, remember again that uh, the word Amazon means breastless. And uh, the Amazons, uh, the women would, uh, cut off their breasts so that they uh, were more, could, it gave them the, the ability to be more skillful according to the legend again, uh, which is just a legend. 
it gave them this ability to be better uh, uh, shots with the bow and arrow. Um, so they physically changed themselves as well. So they too are a kind, you know, they, they are shapeshifters, aren't they, in the play? And uh, the reason I mention this is we'll turn to this idea of shapeshifting today. And then finally, I was thinking about, um, do you recall my uh, analogy where I said that uh, we were discussing the problems of existence and how these problems, uh, we, you know, these problems were born with these problems and they're relentless, they're constant, and uh, most disturbing of all is we, were, we, are, we evolved to be in these states of dissatisfaction because ultimately when you are dissatisfied, you are motivated to act. Um, and I was, I, when I made my analogy, you know, I said that the server, the number one seed uh, in the competition represents the uh, subconscious and the subconscious serves the problem to the to consciousness on the opposite side of the court that uh, when the ball comes across the court consciousness becomes aware of this problem and attempts to hit the ball back but when it, if you think about it if you use a server uh, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm giving it uh, it suggests a kind of free agent doesn't it uh, someone who is thinking and uh, scheming and planning and, you know, uh, preparing to serve that ball, you know, how, how precisely is the, the server going to attempt to hit an ace? So I was thinking, let's replace the number one seed with a tennis ball machine. Because a machine doesn't think, it just spits out the balls. So the subconscious is a machine, the brain recall, according to the realistic view, is a machine. And uh, all of these problems operating at the subconscious level, uh, most, some of them arise to consciousness. Uh, others, other problems are just resolved without our even recognizing that the problem existed to begin with. Again, for example, if I maybe adjust the light over here because um, I feel the glare. I don't like a naked light bulb, perhaps, but perhaps I'm doing this while I'm speaking and I'm not even aware that I do it. It's just become road. It's just become habit. It's a problem that my uh, uh, brain has detected in the past and has become so habituated to fixing the problem whenever it appears that it no longer thinks about it. So yeah, the tennis ball machine, I think, works better. Uh, it, it sort of refines the analogy, doesn't it? Uh, this analogy of the tennis court as the brain and the, uh, the tennis ball machine that fires one problem, one tennis ball, one problem after another, representing consciousness of uh, the subconscious. And then consciousness, of course, is, you know, some balls you don't even recognize because they're some coming so quickly and, and you, or you may just hit them back because you're programmed and you're not even thinking about the problem, but others you see coming, and uh, uh, those are the problems that actually appear in consciousness. Remember, everything's going on in the brain, your thoughts, your feelings, your sensations, all, all of this is happening at the subconscious level. Nothing's happening at the conscious level. Uh, the conscious level is uh, seeing just a little bit, very little bit, uh, of all the problems that your brain is uh, uh, attempting to regulate, to fix, the, all the broken bits that it's attempting to piece together. Um, so the brain is like, I don't know, perhaps the pupil in your eye that sees just a tiny little bit of all of the uh, energy bits that are coming to you at a frequency and producing light, but we don't see all of the energy bits in the room. Uh, if, we, if we did, we would be seeing, uh, we would be seeing, for example, this board 
uh, it would be reflected all over the room, everywhere throughout the room, but our eyes, right, in order to deal with the real world, our eyes evolved to just see a fraction of those energy bits, uh, only a fraction of those actually enter our pupil uh, at a particular frequency. Um, so yes, uh, it's all happening at the subconscious and we're, we're just aware of just a tiny fraction of the problems that our brains are uh, uh, wrestling with, detecting and resolving like one of those famous detectives uh, from literature or from film. Um, and that, uh, the reason I was thinking about that was that today I wanted to introduce another concept that appears on your midterm exam, which is the concept of the problems of free will. And if you remember the romantic, the romantic view is that uh, human beings are free agents that they have the power, in other words, to choose, to freely choose, uh, to freely make decisions in the world. And so romantics imagine that they are ultimately responsible for the choices that they make. Uh, the realist, however, is going to say, well, yes, of course, we make decisions, we choose all the time, but we don't uh, choose freely. We aren't making these decisions uh, on our own, so to speak. It's our brains that are making these decisions. Remember, you are your brain. It's not like you possess your brain. The realist says you are ultimately, essentially, your brain. Um, and so uh, the realist is going to point out a, no a number of problems with this uh, romantic view and the belief of a free will or this ability to freely choose, to freely decide. And the first problem, of course, we always begin with the problem of definition. And by will, I assume we mean desire or perhaps power. Uh, I think desire is a bit clearer if we think of will as desire. But this, so the, the term will is not too difficult to uh, comprehend, to grasp. But the term free, that's a problem, isn't it? Because if you think of the term free, it really is an empty concept unless you use that word uh, within a particular context. In other words, you have to be free from X in order for this word free to make sense. You have to be free from something. Uh, if you don't believe me, go home tonight and uh, Tell your mama or your daddy or your roommate or your best friend, your sweetie pie, just walk in the door and say, I'm free. I'm free. Free at last. I'm free. And I suspect that uh, uh, the other person is going to say, free, what do you mean you're free? I don't understand. You're free? What do you mean? And you might, uh, you're going to have to provide the context in order for them to understand what you mean by this word free. So then you might say, um, uh, I just finished watching Mr. Starkey's lecture and I'm free for the day. I don't have to watch another lecture. I, you know, made my quota of lecture watching for the day. So you're going to have to provide some sort of context uh, in order for this, uh, this concept of free to make any sense, aren't you? And so then that raises the question, just what are we free from? Are we free at all? What are we free from? Well, we're not free uh, from uh, the sensations that we have, are we? I mean, if you uh, prick your finger on uh, the thorn of a rose, you're not free to... Uh, uh, not experience that prick, that little pain that you have. So we're not free from the cessations that we have. And we're not free from our emotions. Uh, if your honey bunny dies in a duel, in a sword fight, the person you care 
more about than anyone else in the world and he or she dies in a sword fight, well, you're not free to not grieve over the loss of Hanuman. So we're not free from the emotions that uh, uh, we experience. We're not free from our thoughts or our experiences in life, are we? I mean, if you think about it, um, well, here, I think, did I write down an example from this one? Maybe I did. No, I don't think I did. Uh, we're not free from our thoughts, from our experiences. Um, if I ask you to name a city in the world, and you've never heard of the city of Athens. You've just, for some reason, you've never learned that there's a city in Greece called Athens, then you're not free to name the city Athens, are you? You just aren't free to do that. Uh, if you've never studied the Greek language, well, you certainly aren't free to write in Greek or to speak Greek because it's not part of your programming, it's not part of your experience, it's not in your brain, it's not part of the programming in your brain. Remember our brain, uh, we become programmed as we experience, as we go out, out into the world and as scientists do experiments and experience the world around us and we become programmed. And if you've never been introduced to the Greek alphabet or the Greek language, you're certainly not free uh, to speak Greek. You're not free to play uh, the musical instrument, the ancient Greek musical instrument, the lyre. I think it's pronounced lyre. You know, that, it, that little instrument shaped like a heart. I mean, if you've never held a lyre in your hands and you've never studied music, you've never practiced, you've never learned anything about music or ever practiced on that particular instrument, well, you're certainly not free to play the lyre. And you're not free, well, you're certainly not free from reasoning. You're not free from the scientific observations that have been programmed in, in you. You're not free to recognize that uh, a brain in pain is a bad thing. You've experienced that, and you're not free to think otherwise, are you? Uh, and then, as a philosopher, when you do the logic, and you realize that one brain in pain is equal, rationally speaking, to another brain in pain, you've made the observations, you know that these other conscious sentient beings on the planet, they're having these experiences as well, just as you are, and their brains can be in these states of dissatisfaction. So you've made this, you've arrived at this, one of these most important philosophical truths that a brain in pain, one brain in pain is, is, is just as bad as another brain in pain. You're just not free to think otherwise any longer. I mean, you can delude yourself, you can try to rationalize yourself around that idea, but you're not really free to think otherwise. Once you learn that one plus one equals two, once you've investigated in, in, the, in the world as a scientist what oneness is, and what you know, what, once you understand the concept of addition and the concept of equals, you're not free to think otherwise. I mean, you can, you can object and say, oh no, one plus one equals three, but no, you really can't think that, can you? You're fibbing. You're fibbing. You're trying to rationalize your way around that truth for whatever psychological need you might have. Um, and of course, that brings us to the biggest problem when it comes to this idea of freely, uh, this idea of a free desire or a free pow uh, power, you know, and that is you're not free to choose. You're not free to make a decision. Your brain makes the choices. Your brain makes the decision. And uh, this isn't as easily apparent as the other examples that I've given, but if you think about it, you can see, you have to do a little bit of you know, in-depth thinking here, but imagine that you're, you're sitting on the couch, and you're relaxing, and suddenly 
a problem arises in your consciousness, your belly's calling you. And then you remember another thought arises in your consciousness from your experience that there's pie in the icebox. And your brain now has a problem. It wants that pie. And the moment a problem is introduced to the brain is the moment that you have a choice, right? You've got to resolve the problem in some way. Should I eat that pie or should I not? And so your brain kicks in. It does what it does as a tool. Your brain kicks in. And at the subconscious level, it begins, you know, doing these sorts of uh, logic, scientific and logic equations. Uh, you know, it's uh, thinking about the scientific facts and adding those facts together logically. Um, and uh, these thoughts can appear in consciousness now that you are aware of the problem and, and focused on this problem. So you're, you're one of the thoughts that might uh, uh, rise up to, your, to the conscious surface would be that, uh, well, I am on a diet. I'm getting those love handles and they're not attractive. And being attractive is important to me. So I don't think I'll eat the pie. But then another thought, the next thought that comes, yeah, but mm, that pie sure was good. And I love pie. It's my favorite dessert. And then, you know, these thoughts can begin to compete with each other. You might think, yes, but, you know, you've got heart problems. <laughs> You've got heart problems. And you're a diabetic. And all that sugar, you know, and uh, all that, all that uh, fat. No, I mean, that's not a, no, don't, no, you don't need that pie. But then on the other hand, he's, yeah, but it's my favorite kind of pie. It's apple pie. That's my favorite. I love apple pie. But then your brain says, yeah, but you know what Honey Bunny's going to say? Honey Bunny's going to get upset with you if you eat that pie. Particularly, Honey Bunny don't like those love handles either. And Honey Bunny cares about you, right? Honey Bunny's grown comfortable with you and secure with you. And Honey Bunny don't, don't want you to have heart disease or a diabetic attack. So, um, yeah, that dragon known as Honey Bunny, watch out. You don't want to feel that wrath. You don't want to feel that heat, that fire-breathing dragon. Uh, but then you think, well, wait a minute. Honey Bunny's out of town. Honey Bunny's in the country for the weekend. Honey Bunny won't know if I take that piece of pie. Problem of the other mind. So uh, finally, you that ultimately, boom, that ultimately uh, determines. Your brain makes that decision then and you hop up off that couch and go get that pie. And you're aware, because as you're resolving the problem, you're aware of these pros and cons. Remember, the moment a problem is introduced to your brain and you have to make a decision, you have a problem, you gotta make a decision. You gotta do something, you gotta act. To eat the pie or to not eat the pie? That is the question. And uh, much of, uh, of the decision-making process will appear in consciousness because you are focused on this particular problem now. Now, there may be other factors, other variables that you aren't recognizing that are happening at the subconscious level and are part of the process of making that final decision of getting up and getting the pie. I mean, one of the problems might be, uh, well, I'm awfully tired. You know, uh, I, I walk the dog around the block several times today. My feet are aching, so I don't want to have to get up and get that pie. I'd rather just lie here, just slump here, you know, <laughs> and not have to move. But then uh, you think, uh, well, you know, uh, 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 I need to exercise. Get up. You can do this. You need to exercise. Now, the, these particular variables, let's call them X and Y, they might be happening at the subconscious level. Maybe your feet are aching, but you're not aware of it because you're so focused on these other variables that your consciousness is aware of. So there may be many unknown variables. Remember, everything that occurs in the universe, every action, and that includes human actions, has a totality of causes. 
And you may not know all of those causes. You probably don't. You're just aware of the few, perhaps the most significant. Uh, those are the ones that are appearing in consciousness. And those causes ultimately produce effects. They lead to these effects. And that's just the problem. That's the law, of, that's the scientific law of causality and the laws of inevitability. It's inevitable whether you're going to get up and eat that pie or not, depending on those variables that are plugged in from your experiences, from your current situation that you find yourself in, uh, how you're feeling, you know, whether your wife's away, how far the refrigerator door is from the couch, all these variables that are part of that equation, that mathematical equation that's trying to determine, uh, your brain trying to determine because it's got this problem to eat the pie or not eat the pie. That's the question. Your brain's trying to determine, it's trying to come to this decision and re resolve the problem. So you aren't free. You're not freely choosing to get up and go get that pie. It feels like you're free, doesn't it? It feels like, oh, okay, I thought about it. I'm gonna now get up and go get that pie freely. But no. You're not really free when you choose to go get that pie. It's an illusion. And remember, illusions are real. Uh, I always refer to magicians. Illusions are real. They do exist, but in the real world. Remember when you watch the magician pull the bunny out of his hat, it looks real, doesn't it? It looks like poof, out of nowhere. I mean, he shows you there's nothing in that hat. There's no bunny rabbit in that hat. You don't see bugs in there, do you? No bugs bunny in there. No Peter Cottontail. He shows you the empty hat, and then suddenly he holds it up, and poof, out comes the rabbit. Wow, magic. Out of nowhere, he produces a rabbit. But we know that's not the reality. If you know a little bit about magician's tricks, you know about the secret compartment at the bottom of the hat. The poor little bunny is holed up in that uh, compartment, and, you know, with a just a press of a little button, the, the flap folds back and out pops the bunny. So uh, illusions exist, they are real in that sense that they exist, but uh, you know, they're not uh, giving you uh, this accurate understanding of what's really going on, are they? And this, uh, uh, this illusion of consciousness, it's, it's a rather clever magic trick, isn't it? Um, but again, it is an illusion. Um, but somebody still might wish to argue and kind of argue, well, it looks like, it feels like I'm free. It feels as if I'm free. But that's when, you know, reason steps in. Uh, you might say, well, it looks like the sun is moving across the sky. Remember, the ancient Greeks believed that there was a sun god. And uh, uh, the sun god, uh, uh, what was his name? Apollo? I don't know. Was that the Roman god? I get my, my Greek, Greek gods and Roman gods mixed up. But at any rate, the sun god was driving in a chariot. His horses were pull, pulling the sun god and, and the sun along with them across the, the sky. It looks like the sun's moving across the sky. But then, uh, that doesn't answer the question, just what is the sun god and how do those horses fly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And just what do you mean you're freely choosing? You're not explaining anything. That's kind of mysterious, isn't it? Uh, and science steps in and says, no, the sun really isn't. That's an illusion. The sun really isn't moving across the sky. What's happening is, through scientific investigation, remember the moment that you say, okay, I'm not going to accept this fact of, some supernatural explanation of a sun god, I'm going to open the door to science and I'm going to try to understand the reality. I'm going to try to open that door to knowledge and, and get the scientific understanding of what's going on with the sun. And we do, and we did, and we discovered that what's really happening is that the earth is actually rotating on its axis and that gives us the illusion that the sun is moving across the sky. But it isn't real. Uh, you might say, well, it feels like the earth is flat. Feels like it, looks like it, look around you. And particularly here in Missouri, <laughs> where there, there ain't no mountain ranges around here, it feels flat, it looks flat, but that's an illusion, isn't it? 
in science tips and says, no, you know, look at these images of the earth from space that we have today. And the earth is actually spherical. Uh, or you might say, well, it feels like the earth is stationary. I don't feel as if I'm moving. My house ain't moving. We're not moving, are we? Doesn't feel that way, but that's an illusion. Science tells you, well, actually, you know, the sun is rotating on its axis at a thousand miles per hour. Whoo, that's mighty fast. We're moving at a thousand miles per hour. And the earth itself is going around the sun, I think at what, 60, 70,000 miles an hour. And the sun itself, and the entire solar system that we inhabit, it's, it's revolving around the, the center of the Milky Way galaxy, right? At, uh, oh, I don't know, hundreds of thousands, six, seven hundred thousand miles per hour. I mean, we are on a fast roller coaster ride here. A fast merry-go-round, actually, aren't we? Feels more like a roller coaster sometimes, life does. Uh, well, sometimes like a merry-go-round. But at any rate, yeah, we're moving. We're moving fast enough to kick all that sawdust out of your head. It's an illusion. And of course, uh, unfortunately in physics, uh, you know, some scientists speculate uh, that there's something called a black hole that exists and they even have uh, processed, processed images that they say, see, but no, we can't take a picture. Uh, we don't have any uh, real pictures of black holes and this idea that there's something at the center of the galaxy around which everything is spinning, called a black hole. Um, because, you know, many people want to imagine that the galaxy acts like the solar system. And in the center of our solar system, we have the sun and all the planets spinning around it. But no, we don't have any good evidence of the existence of black holes. It's just what scientists are speculating, and many of them leap to this conclusion because they desire to, to find an answer. You know, science, especially in the uh, discipline of physics, is in a sorry state today. But, you know, we're assuming that galaxies act the way solar systems do, and it could simply be, you know, it could be a, a very large binary stars in the center, or it could simply be that galaxies are, you know, spinning oh, this side and this side, they're interacting gravitationally around each other. And that's what's going on. There may not be anything at the center of the Milky Way galaxy or of any galaxy. So at any rate, these illusions, it feels like, it seems like, it looks like, uh, it feels like, on the inside, it feels like, I have to confess, it feels like I'm making choices freely. I'm freely deciding. It feels like, I mean, if I were to say, uh, 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 let's say, if I were to ask you, raise your right or left hand, now you've got a problem. Boom, your brain. What does your brain do? What is its primary function to fix a problem? So if I say, raise your right or your left hand, it looks like you make that decision. I mean, how? It can't get any more obvious, can it? I raise my right or I raise my left. But something's going on at the subconscious level. You may not know all these variables. You, you may be aware. You may be going eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and you're aware of that eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a piggy by its toe if it hollers. Yeah, because you don't want to harm a piggy, do you? You don't want to torture a pig. A pig brain in pain is a bad thing. It may not be that intelligent, but it still can feel pain. Intelligence has nothing to do with feeling pain. Pigs are smarter than your doggy or your kitty cat. You wouldn't torture or torment a kitty cat, would you? So eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a piggy by its toe. If it hollers, let him go, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. And then up goes the right hand. Or it may be that you're right-handed. And so that's, you know, you've raised your right hand in the classroom so often that, you know, that's just habit, that's just rote, and that may automatically come up because your brain favors the side, your right hand. That's what its experience is, that's what, uh, uh, you know, it's been programmed to do. Or, uh, I mean, all kinds of variables that you aren't aware of could be uh, raising that right or that left hand. It could be, 
Oh, you might have a thought, I'm right-handed, so he's expecting me to raise my right hand. He knows I'm right-handed, so I'm going to fool Mr. Starkey and raise my left hand. But that thought, those, that process going on is going on, right? You're aware of it, it appears in consciousness, but your brain is doing all of this. Your brain, your subcon the subconscious level, right? The brain uh, that's doing all the, the thinking and the feeling and the sensing. Only a tiny bit of that is appearing in consciousness. So some of those variables might appear there, but others don't. But you, I, some people still, they're really hard-headed and say, but it feels like it, it feels, it feels like there's a little me. And I would agree, it feels like there's a little Mr. Starkey right here, right behind my eyeballs, right here up in my forehead. It's a little me inside pulling all the levers, <laughs> making all the decisions. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my ship. And I'm up out there, back there, doing all the, the, uh, doing all the work. There's a little me back there. Uh, or if you're of a religious uh, belief, you might think it's a soul. Uh, but we use the term consciousness. Some people think consciousness is a separate, distinct. I don't know what they imagine it to be. Something non-physical again. Something mysterious. What is it? You tell me it's not physical. That doesn't explain it. But something distinct from the brain that's doing this free choosing and so forth. But you open up the brain, open up your brain. Let's, let's get a saw out and open up your head and all you're gonna find in there is gray matter. All you're gonna find, if you reduce that gray matter down, all you're gonna find are energy bits and matter bits interacting with each other. That's it. And those energy bits and matter bits, they aren't conscious, they aren't intelligent. They're just part of the machine, part of the universe. It's just a process. <clears throat> That's what's going on in there. It's mechanical. It's a machine. You're a robot. People like, don't like that idea they're a robot. Uh, that hurts their ego, particularly the romantic who thinks humans are somehow special. Uh, you know, this, this idea of freedom operating only one place in the universe that we they, they, they imagine, and that's uh, within the human species. Uh, but no, there's no, there's no entity called a soul or a consciousness or a spirit within. Again, it brings back the problem. What is a soul? What is consciousness? What is a spirit? The definition problem. Where did it originate? The origin problem. How does it interact with the brain? The physical thing. Non-physical interacting with physical? How does that happen? That don't make sense. And then where's your proof? Where's your argument? Where's your scientific evidence? Where's your philosophical argument? There's a really strong philosophical argument with scientific proof to back it up on the other side, the law of causality and the law of inevitability, and then the philosophical argument of determinism. So you gotta, yeah, that's a tough, that's gonna be a tough nut to crack. That scientific evidence, oh, that Mount Everest mountain of evidence, oh, that, that philosophical truth that the, those scientific facts point to. But still it feels, it feels like uh, there's a little me, something inside that's, uh, you know, directing the play. I'm the actor on the stage and the director's in the head here. Um, I was thinking about that fishbowl analogy I used again to think about the subconscious because I think it helps if you you know think about these analogies it helps people helps me I know to understand a little bit better so I'm always thinking trying to think about different analogies but remember the fishbowl is your brain and the water in the bowl is the gray matter you know that's all the energy bits and the matter bits and the chemicals and the uh, the electricity uh, the electrical, you know, the neurochemical processes that are going on, the synapses that are, the trillions of synapses that are connecting your billions of neurons, all that gray matter, all that, uh, all those uh, ingredients in the, in this uh, cake called the brain that go into making up this brain and ultimately the function of the brain is to detect problems. It motivates us uh, to escape pain and that's how we evolved, that's how species evolved to, uh, that's how species continue. If you detect the problem correctly and you're able to resolve it, well, you've got a better chance as a species of getting into the next generation. I don't think that's necessarily a good thing, though. But at any rate, uh, 
So yeah, I was thinking about the bowl and remember the little plastic fishies inside the bowl and uh, those represent, there's one school of fishies that represent your sensations and others, your feelings, and another, another school that represents your feelings, another school that represents your thoughts. And uh, some of these little fishies pop up to the surface and those are the, those are the uh, problems that you detect. But it isn't as if there's uh, a fisherman sitting beside this fishbowl, or perhaps a pond, let's use a pond, the brain is the pond. It isn't that there's a fisherman, You're not a, there's not a, a, a little fisherman inside uh, uh, sitting next to the pond with a fishing reel and, you know, a fishing tackle and, and hooks, and so he's not tossing it in and pulling up freely. I'll pull up this sensation, now I'll pull up this feeling, now I'll pull up this thought. No, there's no fisherman inside the brain. That's an illusion. There is a fisherman in there, but he doesn't have tackle. He doesn't have a line. He doesn't have a reel. He's just a fake fisherman sitting by the pond. He's an illusion. And he doesn't have any power. He doesn't have his fishing rod. He's just watching. All he's doing this fake fisherman, because he doesn't, uh, uh, he, he's just watching which little plastic fishies pop up to the surface. That's all he's doing. But he's fake. He's an illusion. He's like a hologram. Holograms are three-dimensional images. They're illusions. They don't really exist. Uh, they're not really, I remember the Princess Leia hologram in Star Wars. That's not really Princess Leia. It's just an image, an illusion of Princess Leia that's being created by, again, these energy bits interacting with electrons. And that's all that's going on. It's a fake fisherman in the head, an illusion. It, it's not, it's, it's, a, it's a really good illusion. It's a great magic trick. I mean, it's, the, it's a David Copperfield magic trick. Remember David Copperfield and he made the Statue of Liberty disappear? Do you remember that special? That might have been before some of your time. But yeah, that's the kind of illusion consciousness is. It's the David Copperfield illusion uh, of making the Statue of Liberty in front of a, you know, a live audience and you know, a TV audience across the country, across the planet. He made the Statue of Liberty, poof, vanish into thin air. But he didn't really. It's just a magic trick. Now I ain't gonna tell you how he did that. You have to figure that out on your own, scientifically investigate it. Um, but yeah, it's a great illusion. It's, it's the great, well, um, I was thinking Einstein, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not saying because Einstein said something that makes it true. I mean, Einstein got a lot of things wrong, I'm afraid. He himself realized that. That bent space of his, that's a problem, isn't it? Uh, but at any rate, um, Einstein said that time is the greatest of all illusions. There's no such thing as time. And you say, what do you mean? I feel time passing. I see it in the mirror every day, my goodness. I've seen time, 62 years have passed, and I see time passing. But no, time is an illusion. It doesn't exist in the universe. Uh, the reason we think that, uh, you know, we have this concept of time is that uh, an energy bit or a matter bit can't get from point A to point B instantly. It can't, you know, instantly get from A to B. It's got distance to cross. And so, Time is just a byproduct of this electron bit, this energy bit or matter bit getting from point A to point B. That's all it is, but it doesn't really exist. And Einstein said it's the greatest of all illusions. I don't know, I might challenge him there. Consciousness. It's rather easy to understand about time being an illusion. Uh, you know, these energy matter bits can't be instantaneously at A and B. You know, they can't get from A to B 
instantly. No, there's some distance they got moved. And so time emerges out of this, this period. I don't know how else to say it. This period from A to B, this distance from A to B. Um, so yeah, but consciousness. No, I would say perhaps consciousness is the greatest of all illusions. It just very well might be. Um, yeah, I was thinking of another analogy. Just uh, one more, just to help you get a, uh, maybe grasp it a little bit better. Um, again, I probably used this in the past, but think of your brain as your laptop. And uh, the subconscious part of your brain is doing all, it's the central processing unit. It's where all of the information has been programmed. Uh, some of that information is genetic in human beings, very little bit, as I've said before. Most of it, of course, is the experiences you've had in life. And, uh, you know, the uh, logical conclusions, the philosophical conclusions you've drawn, that's programmed in your brain. Like, uh, you know, data is entered into the central processing unit in a computer. So the central processing unit is your subconscious, and the screen on your laptop represents consciousness. Um, and whatever your, whatever the central processing unit is doing, it's doing all of the, right, all of the uh, 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 equations. <clears throat> If you give the computer a problem, if you ask it what's one plus one, well, the central processing unit has a problem out, it goes to work, and it, it comes up with the answer two. One plus one equals two. And then, once it has the answer, that answer is flashed on the screen of consciousness. Very quickly, of course, but it has to come up with the answer in the central processing unit before it can flash it up onto your laptop screen. So your brain is like that. You give it a problem, you say, what's one plus one? Your brain, <clears throat> your subconscious, your <clears throat> central processing unit, it does the math, and then it appears in consciousness on your laptop screen. And you say two. But, I mean, you know how quickly those uh, uh, those equations, that reasoning is being done. I mean, these are neurochemical processes going on, electrochemical processes, and electricity. You know how fast electricity is. So it makes a decision and flashes it up on the screen. Quick, as brief as the lightning in the Kali night, that quick, up there. And it just feels like, ah, consciousness. So when you're thinking about the pie again, the central processing unit has already said, go get that pie. And it's already made a decision. The central processing unit in your brain, the subconscious, and then it flashes up into consciousness on your computer screen. And it says, I think I shall freely choose to go get that pie. But no, the choice has already been made for you. It's already been determined for you. So at any rate, why am I rambling on and on about this? Because this is one of the most serious problems in the play, A Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, it's a problem for lovers. This idea of they don't have a free will. They can't freely choose to make decisions. They aren't free to desire. We aren't free to desire. Um, they've been programmed by their sexual needs, their ego needs, and their cultural needs. And all of these needs, all of these variables go into their equation, their factors in the equation, the mathematical equation. And it says X, X Y, and Z equals you're going to desire this honey bunny or you're going to want that honey bunny. And it's not a free choice. And that's, that's rather frightening, isn't it? I mean, we have the expression falling in and out of love, and there's a reason we use that expression, falling in and falling out. There's no freedom in falling. Oop, I fail. It just happens against your desire, against your wishes. 
actually because of your desires, ironically, these hidden variables beneath. But if you think about it, um, that's a rather frightening thing. This idea that you're not free when it comes to who you desire. That decision's made for you already. Your programming, your experiences in life, and to some extent your genetics have already decided for you that uh, you're going to desire this, but you're not going to desire that. And think about it. The most important person, perhaps, in your life, sweetie pie, honey bun, precious, <sighs> precious baby, <laughs> that most important person in your life, you don't get to choose. You don't get to make that choice. It's been made for you. It's being made for you in your brain. And that's uh, uh, something Shakespeare touches on. Um, yeah, I think I made a list to try to illustrate that a little bit better. Uh, yeah. If you're a straight woman and you don't, there's no way, I'm sorry, that you're going to desire to, uh, if you're a straight woman, there's no way you're going to desire to move in uh, with Snow White and uh, raise seven little baby dwarfs together. You're not going to find true love with Snow White. Go ahead and try. Try to desire Snow White if you're a straight woman. It's not going to happen. If you're a straight man, you're not going to ride off with Prince Charming on his big white horse into the sunset. You can't desire that. Not if you're a straight man. Go ahead and try. Try to desire Prince Charming. Go on, hop on that horse and ride off into the sunset with her. If you're a gay man, well, I mean, think, it, you're not going to want to, if you're a gay man, you're not going to want to uh, plant a big, wet, sloppy kiss on Sleeping Beauty and wake her up and you know, live your happily ever after in the magical Walt Disney world. That's not what you want. You don't desire that. Go ahead, try. Try to freely desire. Try to freely desire that if you're a gay guy. If you're a lesbian, I mean, I could go on and on here, right? I mean, if you're a lesbian, you're not going to want to go to the ball and dance with Prince Charming and then move on in and start scrubbing out his toilets for him because it's true love and you're ready to sacrifice all for true love. No. Go ahead and try that. If you're a lesbian, try. Imagine that. Desire that if you want to. So, yeah, I mean, we just can't desire freely. And that's a problem when it comes to love. I mean, the romantic, remember, remember, the romantic imagines uh, that uh, he or she is a free agent with this freedom of the will and that uh, when he meets that unique person that this is part of a design, part of a plan, and that he is free uh, uh, to choose, uh, uh, ultimately, he has freedom. I, that, that's kind of an, uh, uh, a contradiction, isn't it? It's all part of a design, all part of a plan by some supernatural being who knows in advance who you're going to choose. Well, there's a contradiction in itself, isn't it? But the romantic does believe in this idea of free will, and most romantics think that they're, you know, they're freely choosing uh, the person of their dreams. Um, and of course, uh, you could also think the romantic, you, we think about Cupid's arrow in the play, you know, that uh, 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 idea again, the mystery or the magic behind falling in love. Again, but that suggests too that it isn't free, doesn't it? I mean, you're hit by Cupid's arrow and now you're helpless or the magical flower juice has been sprinkled on your eyelids and suddenly you, I mean, suddenly you want a jackass named Bottom. So, uh, yeah, it's a problem. Even I, I, Romantics need to think this through, this idea of freedom of the will and what it is they imagine, you know, 
this idea of a true soulmate in the world, and if it's if it's destined, uh, I think that even raises a contradiction. I've never really thought of that about that, but yeah, I'll have to give that some more thought. I just there even there is more evidence. It's just not free. It can't be for the romantic who imagines that uh, the universe is somehow designed and particularly if there's some sort of God, supernatural being that knows all and has planned everything in advance, well, where's the freedom in that notion? Uh, but this idea of love, it's, it's not like uh, you're there by the light switch and you can turn the light switch on and suddenly freely desire someone. Uh, see that person? I think I'll switch on the light. Now I freely want that person. No. And when you fall out of love, it's not like you're standing by the light switch and say, you know, I think I'll just freely fall out of love and turn off that light switch. You're no longer the light of my life. <laughs> uh, you're no longer the sun that I revolve around. Uh, no, you can't do that. Hermia can't do that. Helena can't do that. Demetrius, Lysander, Shakespeare's at pains to show us that these young lovers, I mean, they are puppets on the string of desire. They just can't turn it off. Um, Something else is going on here. They are trapped by their biology. They are trapped by their um, uh, their egos. They are trapped by their cultural upbringings. And that's what's determining for them, ultimately, all of these variables, unknown to them, is determining the, 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 the honey bunny they want, the one they need, the one they've got to have. And, uh, you know, it's, that brings up this idea, you're really not free to desire what you find attractive, are you? So you don't know when, when this is going to strike, Cupid's arrow is going to hit you, the mystery, but in reality, you don't know when the circumstances are going to arise and suddenly you're going to be smitten. Uh, you know, it isn't any mystery, remember, it's these other explanations uh, the, that uh, have a footing in the real world and the scientific evidence and the uh, uh, philosophical truths uh, in the real world. But, I mean, you may be standing in line at uh, the Piggly Wiggly supermarket one day and just in front of you, you see an earlobe. And, oh my goodness, you've been programmed to like that shape on an earlobe. That shape of an earlobe Something happened in your past when you were little and you just drawn to that shape of an earlobe. You really are. Maybe somebody with that shape when you were little and had that earlobe and they gave you a cookie. And now it just, you know, now that the hormones have kicked in, you want something sweet. You want something else, some other kind of sweet here. Now it's someone with that kind of earlobe. I don't know why I'm hanging on to my earlobe here. See what my brain's doing. I'm not even aware. Um, but yeah, now you want that particular earlobe. It's got to be just that shape. That's part of the one of the variables in the equation. And you don't get to decide what shape that earlobe is. That happened to you already. You don't get to decide what you desire, what you are physically attracted to. Uh-uh. And, uh, you know, honey bunnies come in all shapes and sizes. And some of them are really hairy like jackasses. And that may be just what it is you want. So uh, it's rather frightening. Turn in your textbooks, and we're going to have to back up just a little. Yeah, there's, you know, the problem, with, the big problem with Shakespeare is that his plays, and this one isn't even particularly long, are just so pat. They are just chock full of ideas. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I mean, you could spend, I could spend just, you know, days and days on just the first act alone. And I can't touch on everything. I'm sure you're breathing a sigh of relief. But I turn in your um, textbooks. I made a list here. Well, no, um, this idea, um, this problem we're exploring now, this sixth problem, this idea that lovers aren't free to desire. They aren't free to turn it on, to turn it off, falling in and out of love. They aren't free to choose their soulmate. They just aren't. 
even though they think they're free agents and they can freely make these decisions, no. Uh, there's something operating behind the curtain there. There's a natural explanation going on. So if you turn in your textbooks back to Act Two, Scene One, Shakespeare's at pains to demonstrate this problem. And it's a scary problem, as I said. You don't get to choose that special someone you're going to spend the rest of your life with. Uh-oh. That's scary. My wife's name is Sherry, and I say, that's scary, Sherry. But at any rate, Act Two, Scene One, I'm on page, uh, what page am I on? 1353, line 194 at the top of the page. And here we have Demetrius. He's run off into the woods. He's hunting down Hermia. He can't help himself. Now remember, Hermia don't love Demetrius. She, uh, kiddo, he's a bother. Shoe fly, shoe, be gone. He's a wicked witch. Be gone before somebody drops a house on you. She doesn't want anything to do. And yet he's pursuing her in the woods because he can't turn that light switch off. He's that puppet on the strings of desires. He needs her for whatever, you know, he's sexually attracted to her. He's, he's drugged on hormones and his ego needs her. Maybe it's even turned on more because she doesn't want him. He's got to feel like the winner and she presents a challenge for him. That might be, uh, you know, one of the, the causes here, one of the variables. Now, I'm speculating there, but you know, and when you write your essays, you're welcome to speculate. I mean, speculation can be part of your argument, absolutely. But you just gotta let us know you're speculating. You gotta say, it may be that one reason why Demetrius is so attracted to Hermia is that she rejects him. And for a lot of people, when they're rejected, that just Right? That just pushes their ego buttons more. They want to conquer this person who's rejected them. That'll make them feel even more powerful. <gasps> yeah. They imagine getting that someone who's impossible to get. Imagine. Beyonce in your dreams. Imagine what, how that might feed your ego if that's what attracts you. If you could actually get Beyonce in your bed, she's no longer your dream girl. No. Now she's your sex partner in bed. Yeah, come on. That's going to feed your ego quite a bit. So his ego, he's on the strings of desire. His ego, his, his ego has drugged him. And his culture too. Remember, his culture has told him, yeah, I mean, first of all, you're a man. Uh, you see a woman, you take that woman. Might makes right. You in the patriarchal world, men rule, baby. They dominate. And he's also been fed this idea of true love. Huh? And true love, remember, it's a cross to bear. The course of true love never did run smooth. And true love conquers all. So he's got all these cliches, all these, what the culture's taught him this. He's bought into that idea. And so he's drugged by his culture, too. He's a druggie. He's a druggie. <laughs> he's addicted. And so he's fled after uh, Hermia into the woods. She, she don't want him. And Helen is pursuing Demetrius. And he, you know, the irony here is, you know, Demetrius, the last thing he wants is uh, Helena snapping at his, you know, chasing him off into the woods. He wants nothing to do with her. Absolutely. I mean, he's, he's like Br'er Rabbit. Br'er Rabbit don't want nothing to do with Br'er Fox. So, uh, you can tell I was raised in North Carolina and the stories of Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Fox and Br'er Bear. Uh, but anyway, but these lovers, they can't turn it on or turn it off. They can't help what they're drawn to. Falling in and out of love and what you're drawn to. They're not free to choose here. And that's disturbing. Look what, uh, look what Demetrius says to Helena. She's pursuing him and he's trying to flee from her and he's off pursuing uh, Hermia. Here's the irony is Demetrius can't even recognize that what he detests about Helena, Hermia detests about Demetrius. So look what he says at the top of the page. I'm at line 194. Hence, get thee gone and follow me no more. I mean, you can hear the frustration 
in his voice. And look what she says in response. You draw me, you hard-hearted adamant. Look at the, uh, the metaphor here. This hard-hearted, cruel adamant. And the adamant, of course, uh, uh, in mythology, the adamant is this magical stone. It has the, the properties to draw. It's, a, it's the strongest. Uh, uh, it, it has these magnetic powers. It can draw uh, 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 anything to it. It's, it's got these magical properties, this adamant. And she says that's what he is. He's an adamant. She doesn't understand why she's drawn to him. She, she just knows she is, and, and he's this, ma this magical, magnetic, powerful force uh, from which, uh, you know, uh, she just can't escape. You know how powerful some magnets can be. She just, uh, once she's in that range of that magnet, she can't escape that. And he's cruel because uh, she's drawn to him, yet he doesn't want her. She says, you draw me, you hard-hearted adamant, but yet you draw not iron, for my heart is true as steel. And here again, this idea of true love, uh, you know, she's drugged on this notion of true love too. Her love is as true as steel. And remember, iron in comparison to steel, iron is a base metal and steel has been tempered. I think there's a, is there? Yeah, it says uh, here, where is it? I thought it was in your footnotes here. Yes. No? Hmm. Yes. Number eight. Footnote number eight. Hermia contrasts the base metal iron with steel, which holds its temper. So uh, steel is much more powerful than our, uh, 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 iron uh, because it's more compacted with the matter, energy and matter bits, so it's tougher. It's stronger. It's tougher to break than iron is. And that's what her love is. Her true love is like steel. It isn't some base metal like iron. It's been tempered and it's become steel. And, uh, you know, she wants to uh, try. She's trying to convince him, trying to persuade him that her love is true. This is true as steel. She says, leave you your power to draw and I shall have no power to follow you. And there's the irony. He can't leave his power to draw her. She's fixated on him. She's controlled. Again, she's that puppet on the strings. She's just drawn to him, and he, can, and he can't leave his power. It's not like he can change and metamorphose, you know, shapeshift into something she will find reprehensible and she will loathe. So they're both caught in this net of desire. And neither one can escape from the net. That's frightening. And look what he says. Do I entice you? Do I speak you fair? Or rather, do I not in plainest truth tell you I do not, nor I cannot love you? I mean, can he be any more emphatic? And not only does he not love her, but he says, I cannot. It isn't in my power. No matter how hard I try, I just oh, can't flip that light switch on. You just don't make my bone burn. It's just not happening for me. He tries to explain to her. I mean, you can see the frustration. But she's in the, you know, it's just as painful for her. I mean, who's the victim here and who's the victimizer? Is she the victimizer for pursuing him? Uh, uh, is he the victim? Or is he the victimizer for you know, uh, here he actually threatens her. He appears on the surface to be the victimizer, but, you know, there comes a point where she's stalking him. There comes a point where he might need to defend himself against her. Victim and victimizer, they're both really caught, aren't they, in this steel, no, the, yeah, this steel trap, this steel netting of desire. That's how powerful the netting is. Do I entice you? Do I, I cannot, I do not, nor I cannot love you. Underscore that word, cannot. And look what she says in return. And even for that, do I love you the more? Again, that idea that he's unattainable and that feeds her ego. If she could attain him, that would feed her ego. 
she's like a groupie at a rock concert. You know, those people in the front, most of them, you know, most rock stars are men, and most of the groupies up front are straight women. There might be some gay men up front too. But I mean, the idea of the rock god, I mean, they want to touch the rock god. You see people reaching out to touch the rock god. Please, just touch my hand. They want to be part. They want to be recognized by the rock god. I mean, the rock god's up there shaking, doing his thing, and all that sweat's flying off. They're just like, oh, feed me that sweat. Feed me, Seymour. You know, bathe me in it. They just want to participate in that rock god's reality. You know, they want to be oh, rock god's illusion. We know what the rock god is behind the stage, off stage, isn't he? He ain't no god. Uh, no. Um, he's all too human. But at any rate, you know, these groupies, she's like a groupie. He's the rock god. And if she could get that rock god, at least just get his attention. Just, even if he says, you know, get away from me. Well, now she's got it. He's recognized her. She's part of his universe. Uh, that's, that's why she, she just, mm, that's feeding her. It's crushing her, but it's feeding her too. If she could just be part of him, just think how, how that would feed her ego. Shakespeare has a really good understanding of the psychological problems of the ego, doesn't he, here? And even for that, do I love you the more? You're the rock god, baby. And look what she says. I am your spaniel. Look at that metaphor. She's a dog. She's a spaniel. And we know that the dog uh, tr traditionally is uh, 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 symbolizes this idea of loyalty, of faithfulness. I mean, you know, you can abuse a dog and it will come back. And many of them will still come back for, for more. Um, dog is man's best friend. I mean, they are the, you know, the symbols of faith and loyalty, even sometimes despite abuse. I am your spaniel. And to me, so look how she's did it, you know, she's did it, putting herself down, denigrating herself, but it doesn't matter. Even if she's his dog, even if he abuses her, as some people abuse their dogs, you know, some really big jackasses who abuse their dogs. Um, I am your spaniel. And she still wants to be part. She, she doesn't mind the abuse. And uh, now here's an interesting idea. You know, we said a pain in, uh, a brain in pain is a fundamentally, intrinsically a bad pain. But here she wants the pain. Why? Well, I would argue because if he abuses her, yes, that's painful. But it's alleviating a worse pain. The pain of her ego, of not having him, of feeling like the loser. Uh, you know, we mentioned last time this idea of this, uh, the sexual sadist or the sexual masochist, and they actually enjoy the whip. The, you know, the masochist enjoys the pain of the whip. And that would seem to contradict this idea that a brain in pain is essentially, intrinsically a bad thing. But we know that that pain of the whip, yes, it's bad. It hurts. It stings. But it's alleviating a deeper pain a deeper pain that's been programmed in this brain, this masochist brain, sometime in his past. Something happened in his past that damaged his ego. And the only way to escape that damaged ego is this very real pain. It's like uh, replacing a, 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 a worse pain with a bad pain. Uh, you, you see it also, um, it's particularly a problem for, for women, right? Uh, that, that uh, I don't know what the, uh, what the psychological, uh, uh, what it's called, this, uh, uh, this problem that women have when they cut themselves. Uh, that's painful. But why do they do it then? Because there's a greater pain they're trying to escape, a psychological pain. So uh, I still, it holds that it's still painful when they cut themselves. That's still painful. It's not as if they're enjoying it. And the crack, the whip, I mean, that's still fundamentally, essentially, on the masochist's back. That still hurts. Uh, but it's, uh, it's uh, alleviating, it's helping the masochist, it's helping the woman who suffers from this psychological uh, uh, is it a disease or I don't, I don't know. I could look that up. 
but it's helping to alleviate that greater pain, that psychological pain. Something's happened, you know, in these people's past, and uh, this is a, a they've they uh, somehow in their experiences they they've fallen upon this this idea that if I do this, it will help. But if I cause this kind of pain, it will make that kind of pain. Uh, uh, alleviated or temporarily I can escape from that kind of pain. But anyway, I am your spaniel and Demetrius. The more you beat me, I will fawn on you. Use me, but as your spaniel, spurn me, strike me, neglect me, lose me. Only give me leave unworthy as I am to follow you. What worser place can I beg in your love and yet a place of high respect with me. Notice the ironies here. Give me this pain. Abuse me. Beat me. Harm me. You know, do what you will. I'm worthless. But, uh, you know, I, I will feel really good about myself if you will just Just recognize me in some way. This place, the place of a dog, is a place of high respect with me than to be used as you use a dog. What worse a place can I beg in your love than to be used as you use your dog? And yet for her, the irony is, it's a place of high respect with me. Because if she can't get that rock god's attention, even if that rock god, you know, it's sweat hitting on her. Ugh. Most of us go, oh, no. No. That. Ugh. But for her, it would give her a sense of fulfillment, a sense of, you know, it would, uh, uh, her, her self esteem would skyrocket. She can participate in the God's pride. It will rain. He's crushed her pride by not wanting her. But she can, she can uh, 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 get that pride back if she can be recognized, be part of Demetrius' universe. And Demetrius tries everything. I mean, at one point here, he even threatens to uh, uh, rape her. And she still will not. That's why I asked the question, victim or victimizer. I mean, he's frustrated to the point where he makes this threat of actually raping her in this passage here. Um, and that's a rape. Come, let's understand, it's a violent act. And some rapes, uh, well, I guess it depends on the degree of violence. Some are really horrific. Uh, some are far more violent than others. But um, it's also a sexual act. I mean, sex and the violence are linked. Uh, and I would argue that Demetrius, that this is not a real threat here, uh, because he doesn't really want, he doesn't, does he, he doesn't want anything to do with her sexually. And she, at this point, I mean, she's completely shoe fly. Go away. I, you know, you just bother some. So, uh, but you can see, I mean, he is threatening her, but I would say that it's just, it's a last resort on his part, and, and he doesn't threaten her, does he? Instead, he says, I'm going to desert you here, and he runs off. He leaves her in the woods to the wild beast, he says, uh, at the end of this, uh, toward the end of this passage at the bottom of the page. He's going to leave her to the mercy of the wild beast, and that's ironic, isn't it? Because we know, we've seen that those beasts in the, in the forest, they show no mercy. They're just not smart enough. When lions kill, when these predatory animals kill, they don't know no better. They don't understand their cause and harm. They just don't get it. They don't have enough neurons to understand uh, that they're causing that torment and torture. So, um, yeah, these couples are pursuing each other. Remember that phrase? Pursuing each other uh, uh, with the soul of love. That's the phrase that Oberon uses. He says, Titania, 
when she wakes from this, uh, after this magical flower juice has been placed on her eyes, she shall pursue whatever her eyes lay sight on at first sight. She shall pursue it with the soul of love. And of course, this is, uh, uh, Oberon is speaking metaphorically here, I would argue. And here we see what this soul of love is. And it ain't pretty. Mm -mm. It's irrational. It is. Um, I mean, it has to be. Demetrius has told her, I don't love you, I can't love you. And Helena, she can add the facts. One plus one equals two. She understands this. Demetrius understands that Hermia doesn't want him. He can add up one plus one equals two. She's told him in no uncertain terms that she hates him. Hermia says, I hate you, Demetrius. And Demetrius is saying, get away from me, or I just might, uh, out here in the woods in the dark, away from society and civilization, I might just turn animal and rape you violently. And he's going to leave her in the end to the mercy of the wild beast. She's got, a, 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 Helena's got her saying, one plus one equals two. Demetrius don't, don't, he just don't want me. But why can't she figure that simple equation out? Why can't Demetrius figure that equation out? Why can't most people figure out, most romantics, right, most comic optimists understand one plus one equals two? What gets in the way of their ability to reason? And again, this idea, reason versus desire. Their needs. This is the soul of love. Desire, need, want. They are driven. They are addicted. They are on the drugs. And that makes them dangerous to themselves and to others. That makes them dangerous. They can't add one plus one equals two. And if you come across a brain in the world that can't figure out that one plus one equals two, you know what you've met. You know, you've met a sexist. You've met a racist in the world. You've met a religious terrorist. That's someone you've met. You've met a speciesist. That's someone who can't add one plus one equals two. That's, of course. Some addictions are so great. And this addiction of love, this is a tough habit to break because of all these variables that we've discussed. And these people, these young lovers, they do in Act 3. Let's turn to Act they do turn violent, don't they? The beast is loose. And these beasts, these young lovers, they show no mercy to one another. They are loose in the woods, in the dark. And their desires, their hungers, their souls of love have unleashed the beast within, the animal within. And they show absolutely no mercy to each other. So let's turn to Act 3, Scene 2, and this bad behavior of the beast. Now, of course, there's a, a, a tragic irony here, as I pointed out. And that is that they ought to know better. They are human beings. They do have brains. Remember Shakespeare's, remember Lysander's words, and touching now the point of human skill, what does separate us from the beasts in the wild? Reason. They ought to be able to add up one plus one equals two and realize that a brain in pain is a brain in pain. And rationally speaking, it doesn't matter which brain, and ethically speaking, you don't want your brain to be hurt. So why are you going to hurt somebody else's brain? They ought to be able to figure that out because they are human. And the point of human skill, 
the point of what sets human beings apart, what does make them special and unique, is their ability to reason. And so when human beings aren't able to reason, when they become animalistic, animals, let's face it, in comparison to humans, I know it's an ugly word and we're not to use it, but just to uh, get you to understand, animals are retards when it comes to uh, comparing them to human beings. They just don't have the ability, they don't have the neuro neural power the neurons to understand that they're causing harm to other conscious feeling beings. If a dog bites you, it don't know no better. It doesn't understand. It just doesn't. If a pit bull attacks a little baby and kills it, mauls it to death and kills it, it just doesn't understand. But a child molester? What's getting in the way of the reason? The ability of that child molester to reason. When it brutalizes a baby and kills it, it's psychology, it's need, it's want, it's desires. And, you know, some child molesters, they don't want to cause any harm. It's just that they love children. There's that word again. They love children. They imagine that they're going to carry them off to, I don't know, Michael Jackson's Never Never Land. And they're going to have a good time with the children. And they want to make the children happy and please the children. And they just want to love them. They want to love them sexually. So they may not even have this intention of harming. Some child molesters, they, you know, they have to... They have to rationalize and, and uh, they know, they know they shouldn't. And some of them manage to keep their desires in check out of fear, or just simply no opportunity or whatever variable it might be. But some of them can't keep those desires in check. And even the child molester who just wants to love the child, just wants it all to be a never, never land, you know, Peter Pan and Tinkerbell, uh, even if those attentions are good, that child molester still has to know that, no, a child, we know now that children can be psychologically damaged for life. They're not rational. They can't give you consent. They don't understand the concept of consent. And these lovers in this, these woods are going to turn ugly. The beast, as I said, is going to be uh, uh, loosed and they're going to show no mercy and the irony the tragic irony is they ought to know better they you know once you reach a certain IQ level you ought to know better and the animals just haven't reached that IQ level they just don't know any better um, and this passage act 3 scene uh, 2 Act 3, scene 2. I'm going to begin at line 63. Act 3, scene 2, line 63. Um, I'm going to point out the animal imagery in, the, in this scene. And this scene, when produced on the stage, it's one of the funniest moments in the play. I mean, particularly at, uh, uh, under, at the hands of a really uh, uh, good director who knows, uh, understands comedy. Uh, really good actors and directors. You know, it's a it's a joint effort here. This production of the stage. You know, you've got a good uh, uh, philosophical understanding of what makes something funny. Uh, this this moment of the play it, does, it descends into slapstick humor, uh, and uh, you know, some people find the Three Stooges humor really funny. I used to, I had a, a years a, a years back I had a best friend who just worship the Three Stooges. He was an addict. And, you know, that slapstick humor, much of it is violent, aggressive, and I just, uh, personally, just couldn't find it interesting. You know, that's projected value. Um, but, you know, even I, watching the Three Stooges, at times I would catch myself laugh. Absolutely, sure. 
uh, when somebody slips on a banana peel, sometimes you laugh, even though you know, oh, ouch, that's got to hurt. Um, so I haven't really thought enough about comedy, philosophized enough on it. So if that interests you, you could start, you know, thinking about comedy, how it's being used in this play. Uh, you know, you might have to read a, a book, a, a philosophical book on comedy and get some ideas, one or two ideas, and see how those might be operating in Shakespeare's play. That would make a really good topic for this play. Uh, but I haven't had time recently to, to uh, delve into this, uh, you know, getting an understanding of a more in-depth, analyzing comedy, getting a more in-depth of understanding of the types of comedy and how they operate and why they make us, you know, react the certain ways that we do. But this slapstick humor, yeah, this could be one of the funniest moments in the play, but like the Three Stooges, uh, I think we have to keep in mind, even my friend who likes the, you know, the humor, the slapstick humor of the Three Stooges, you know, when they poke each other in the eyes and they, you know, in, in animated cartoons, you know, you see this in animated cartoons, you see the coyote run off a cliff and drops and flattens out like a pancake. Well, that's fine. You know, the coyote, he's an animated, he doesn't exist. And the Three Stooges are just acting, yes, of course. But, you know, we have to keep in mind that uh, in the real world, and, you know, Shakespeare's trying, of course, these actors on the stage, you know, they're playing a role here. But in the real world, uh, well, even in the real world, sometimes, as I say, you watch someone, uh, you know, trip on the sidewalk and I used to, I remember if ever I tripped in public, I was embarrassed. I, I would try to get up and act like, or you know, like I purposely tripped so that people wouldn't think that, oh, look at that idiot, you know, look at him, loser, you know, what a klutz. So yeah, yeah, as I said, it's robotic. We just react, don't we, even in reality. But we do have to realize we can use this higher, this, uh, the point of higher skill reason. We do realize that's got to hurt. Somebody hits you over the head. One of the stooges hits you over the head with a frying pan. You gotta understand. In reality, that would hurt, and that's what's happening here. We've got to keep in mind, and I think Shakespeare wants to keep this in mind that what these uh, young lovers are doing with each other, this verbal aggression, this name calling, and this physical aggression, Lysander and Demetrius challenging each other to, to a duel. Uh, fortunately, we're in a romantic comedy. So Shakespeare is not going to let these two young men duel to the death. He's, he's on the surface, right? He's ostensibly, superficially writing a romantic comedy. So he can't get too dark. But he's going to have them challenge each other to a duel. And he's going to show Hermia trying to get hold of Helena and scratch her eyes out. And he's going to show Helena fleeing from Hermia. So there's quite a bit of physical violence in this scene or the suggestion thereof, let us say that. Some directors will go, you know, even further and show some, you know. Uh, there is some physical bias, yes, because, you know, Hermia does latch on to Lysander. And, you know, she trespasses into his physical space and grabs hold of him. You know, she's trying to say, please, Lysander, please, you know, and he's, let me go, let me go. Um, so, yeah, there is some physical violence, actual physical violence, but most of it is suggested the threats and the challenge, the duel, the challenge with swords to, to the death. That is all here and it is present and Shakespeare wants to keep this in the background here, of course, it is a romantic comedy. Remember the, the, the blood and the, the horror is always kept off stage for the most part. It's just suggested before us. Um, in the ancient Greek tragedies, remember, all the horror is off stage. Here in this comedy, Shakespeare's not writing a, 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 a he's, his business here is to keep within the romantic uh, comedy borders here. And uh, I, I think it's a kind of rhetorical strategy because people eat this stuff up, romantic comedies. It's a way for him rhetorically to draw people in and start introducing these ideas that are disturbing and to get them to confront them and think about them. After they've walked away and been entertained and laughed and had a good time, then some of these ideas and thoughts begin to seep in. And it does for many people, as we've said earlier. And some people even analyze the play further and they really, they discover something 
very ugly here in this play going on. So at any rate, if you look at line, uh, I'm, I'm in Act 3 now, uh, scene 1, uh, is this, yeah, no, Act 3, scene 2, and if you look at line uh, on page 1365, am I even on that page? Boy, my eyes, it's getting dark out. It's getting ready to lightning and thunder. I guess Zeus is uh, upset with me for some reason. Okay, let's see. 1365, yes. 1365, uh, or, uh, page 1365, Act 3, Scene 2. And I'm at the bottom of the page. And Demetrius and Hermia are quarreling. And uh, Hermia wants to know. She believes Demetrius has harmed Lysander. Remember, she wakes up in the woods and Lysander's run off. She doesn't know where he's fled. And we know Lysander's pursuing Helena. The juice puck dropped in his eyes. He's now, I mean, he's fixated. He's that, he's that druggy chasing down. You know, he's, he's got to get that fix. Uh, he's got to, uh, uh, you know, he's got to shoot up. And the only thing that can fix his problem for Lysander is Helena. So Hermia says to Demetrius, she says at line uh, 63, Ah, oh, good Demetrius, wilt thou give him? Wilt thou give him me? And she thinks uh, Demetrius has harmed Lysander and is, you know, hidden him off in the woods somewhere. And look at Demetrius' response here. How ugly. I had rather give his carcass to my hounds. So the idea that he'd rather feed his body to his dogs, his hounds, his hunting dogs. And again, this suggestion here that uh, Demetrius is all too willing. Hermia is accusing him of having perhaps harmed, even killed Lysander. She's accusing Demetrius of this. And Demetrius is letting it be known that he would have no hesitation, no qualms whatsoever in hunting Lysander down. And once uh, uh, killing him, feeding his carcass to his hounds. And again, the hounds, remember, the beast, this animal imagery. We see the hounds eating the carcass of Lysander. And, uh, you know, we humans, we understand uh, the tragedy and the suffering that comes with dying, particularly a gruesome death, like being hunted down. And uh, this idea that we should show a bit of dignity to the dead, even though, you know, irrationally speaking, they are dead, they're no longer conscious. Uh, so they're unaware of what happens to the body. Remember, uh, 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 the brain is like the chessboard. And uh, the pieces on the chessboard, the particular arrangement, the arrangement of the neurons, that's consciousness. And uh, when you upset the, the chessboard, when the brain is dead, the pieces on the chessboard, that, you know, when you overturn the chessboard, when the brain dies, Consciousness dies with the brain. Consciousness is a byproduct of the brain. When the brain dies, consciousness dies. The chest pieces, when the board is flipped over and is no longer functioning properly as a chess board, when the brain no longer is functioning properly, when the neurons are no longer, no uh, neurochemical processes are continuing to uh, you know, operate uh, in the brain, these electrochemical processes, and when those are no longer occurring, then the brain is dead, the chessboard is turned over, and consciousness, the arrangement of the pieces in a particular way on that chessboard, how that brain's been programmed, and on every chessboard, right, we've got these different arrangements of the chess pieces, depending on your experiences in life. That, too, is destroyed. The pieces fly off the board, and that particular arrangement we call consciousness, the subconscious and consciousness. Subconscious consciousness, these byproducts of the brain, they too uh, are no longer exist. But nevertheless, this idea of showing respect to the fact that this individual did exist and, uh, uh, you know, wanting to you know, we have we hold uh, memorial services in memory of the one who's passed. To remember, we'll see this idea in Hamlet. 
uh, it's part of closure and also part of trying, you know, again, it's this ego idea of trying to say this person who lived mattered. This person had importance. This person was significant. And here the idea of feeding Lysander's carcass to his hounds, we can see the indignity in uh, that image. And this is what Demetrius thinks of Lysander. This is what, and he tells her, you know, uh, this is what he would do. I mean, Demetrius, uh, and, uh, uh, Lysander and Demetrius' brain can't get, you know, can't get any lower. He's only fit to be fed uh, to his hounds. The carcass uh, uh, of Lysander. And look at Hermia's response. Look what she calls him. Out dog. Out cur. Again, this bestial imagery here. He's a beast to say such things. This animal imagery we're going to see throughout this passage. Thou drives me past the bounds of maiden's patience. Oh, what wouldn't she do? You know, but remember, she's in a patriarchal order and she's been told to behave, be proper like a maiden, like a good lady. But she's driving her past all of her upbringing, all of what she's learned how to behave. Hast thou slain him then? Have you killed him? Henceforth, be never numbered among men. And here's that idea. You are less than human. If you have slain him, you just can't figure it out. Uh, of course, I don't know if she's thinking along these lines of that he's irrational to do so. She, she's so attached to Lysander that if Demetrius has indeed slain Lysander, killed Lysander, then he is less. He is an animal. He is a beast. And again, this irony here that human beings have this potential to understand, to comprehend the harm that they cause, they can cause. And so when they misbehave, they're worse than the animals because the animals can't understand. That's actually worse. So human beings have the ability to behave worse than the beast, the wild beast, than any beast. And that's what these young lovers are doing here. Oh, once tell me true, tell true. She, the problem of the other mind. She wants to know the truth here, and she suspects, but she, you know, she doesn't know. What has he really done? She's trying to access his brain, Demetrius' brain, to find out, oh, once tell true, tell true, even for my sake. Remember how much you care for me, then tell me the truth here. Durst thou have looked upon him being awake, and hast thou killed him sleeping? Here's that idea again of killing someone in his sleep. The idea of, you know, how low is that? Not even to give someone a fighting chance uh, to defend himself. The idea that we're vulnerable when we're sleeping. You know, what a cowardly way. If that's your enemy and you're going to resort to violence, well, that's the coward's way. You ought to be able to at least confront your enemy face to face if you, you know, if you absolutely have to descend into violence, I would say you need to make an argument. But sometimes the arguments just won't take. You're just not going to convince that Ku Klux Klan member with an argument. You may have, you know, when they're starting to lynch people, you may have to go to war. That brain is broken. It, that toaster's going to catch the entire house on fire. You don't have to unplug that toaster and trash it. Or at least unplug it, yeah and put it somewhere where it can't do no harm. So, yeah. And she's saying, have you killed him while he was sleeping? Oh, brave touch. Notice the irony in her voice, the sarcasm just dripping there. What a cowardly way to confront your enemy when he couldn't defend himself. And look what she says next. Could not a worm, an adder do as much? Now he's worse than an animal. I mean, we're going down the evolutionary uh, branches, a uh, trunk, uh, the, you know, the lower form, the animal with less neurons, uh, the, the uh, uh, conscious sentient beings with even fewer neurons than an animal. Uh, right now we're looking at 
worms and adders, reptiles. You're a worm, you're a snake, you're a serpent. Could not a worm and adder do so much? An adder did it. For with doubler tongue than thine, thou serpent, never adder stung. She's saying you're worse than a reptile. You're worse than an adder, than a serpent. You have a double tongue. That's the, the duplicitous nature of you. That you, because a serpent and adder, you know, it evolved to, stint, to bite and poison. It didn't know what it's doing. You should know better. Is there, maybe there's a fourth one. More forked of the adder than duplicitous. Yes, that's where that word, see, that word stuck in my brain somewhere. Duplicitous. He's more duplicitous because from the human perspective, adders look duplicitous, sneaky. The snake sneaks up to its victim, right? Slithers into the garden. Net. It's a predator. It lurks. The snake in the grass. It lurks. We imagine, you know, that's what predators do. It's duplicitous. Some snakes, you know, they're the, they're, 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 they might be the color of, you know, some predators, they've evolved to actually... Uh, be the color of the belief that they're uh, uh, sitting on quietly, slyly, waiting for the victim to come along. Uh, I think some snakes, you know, they've got these natural colorings and stripes and so forth. Does an adder have that? I don't know. That'd be interesting to determine. An adder did it. For with, she's calling, you're an adder. For with doubler tongue than thine, thou serpent, never adder stung. Because again, she's reminding us, Shakespeare's reminding us that the adder appears to be sneaky and sly, but it's not thinking. The adder's not sitting there lurking in the grass saying, I'll wait here, I'll be sneaky, I'll be sly, and I'll wait till a victim comes along, and then I'll bite it and poison it and gobble it up, or I just swallow it whole, eat it while it's still breathing. A horrible image, isn't it? Imagine being eaten alive, being swallowed alive. There must be moments where the mice that are being eaten by snakes, and that pain, uh, maybe, you know, they're even within the, the horror. I, well, I'm sorry, again, the psychology. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you, uh, when I say my psychology can't go there, you're, if you've got a mission in life, you've got a cause, you know, you've got to be in the war. You, you've got to put some of these things out of your mind if you've got to stay focused on the battle. You can't focus on the horrors of the Holocaust because it might just debilitate you to such a point where you just, you know, you can't pick up the rifle and go to war because you've just become so psychologically depressed and horrified by you know, the madness of the Holocaust by what you see before you, the, the magnitude of it, and you just, you know, you can't get the, mm. some people react that way. I, I, I'm, I, I may be one of those people, I don't know why, I guess I could explore that, but at any rate, an adder did it, for with doubler tongue than thine, thou serpent, never adder stung, because uh, uh, if, if Demetrius killed Lysander in his sleep, then Demetrius is being sly and sneaky, whereas the adder, the serpent, can't, it's, it doesn't understand what sly and sneaky means. But Demetrius knows. He's got enough neurons to understand that. And then, uh, so, you know, he's worse than an animal. We get this reptilian imagery as well, This, in addition to this bestial imagery. Uh, uh, look next at uh, page 1370. I mean, throughout this passage, now let's turn to Act 3. Scene two, throughout Act three, scene two, you could call it, think of this as the slapstick scene where all the four lovers finally come together in the woods and, you know, mayhem erupts. The volcano explodes. And uh, a lot of fire and brimstone. This is a hellish moment in the play, but it's played for laughs again. Uh, but nevertheless, rationally speaking, we can understand, even though we might be reacting at the moment like knee jerks, we might be laughing and finding much of it funny and humorous. That's the knee-jerk reaction. Uh, you know, uh, that's uh, how uh, our brains have been programmed to react these certain ways. I don't know. You could, 
Again, that's the idea of comedy. I won't go back there. But at any rate, so look at the next passage, page 1370, and this time Lysander tells Hermia, because Hermia is holding on to Lysander. She can't understand. Hermia can't understand. Here again, the problem of the other mind. Uh, by the way, uh, when Demetrius says, I haven't killed Lysander, the problem of the other mind, Hermia doesn't believe him. She doesn't trust him. So we've seen this idea, people can lie, you don't know if they're telling you the truth, that's a problem. People can be telling you the truth and yet you think they're lying, there's a problem. The suspicion and doubt that you still harbor. And then I mentioned this problem today, uh, although I don't think this is a problem in reality, that you actually just imagine, this would be a worse problem if it actually existed, imagine being Gilligan and the castaways of, uh, of the, the uh, island lost and uh, being able to read each other's minds and thoughts. That, that would make an interesting play, wouldn't it? Well, it's already been done on Gilligan's Island. <laughs> anyway, but at any rate, um, let's see, where was I? You can tell I get really passionate talking about these ideas and so forth. Um, sometimes I just can't contain myself. All right, so page 1370, Hermia is holding on to Lysander, the problem of the other mind. She doesn't understand. She can't understand. You, you love Helena? You don't love me anymore? What's going on? Are you, is it, are you being serious? Are you playing? Is this a game? Are you, are, you know, and Helena too. Helena thinks all three have conspired against her to mock her, to make fun of her. Such is the depths to which her self-esteem has plummeted. She thinks they're all in cahoots. She's a conspiracy theorist, isn't she? She thinks they're all playing a joke on her. And she keeps telling them, you know, this is hurting me. This is, and they, you know, they keep professing. Dimitri says, no, I love you, it's true. And I said to her, I love you, I love you. Of course, we understand what's happening here, the magical flower juice symbolizing their, their hormones, particularly their hormones in this case. Uh, you know, their brains are seething, their brains are hopping on the hormones, as I've said before. Uh, that'd make a good title to the play, wouldn't it? Hopping on the hormones. Uh, uh, at any rate, in this image, uh, Lysander turns to Hermia. She's hanging all over him. You know, she's becoming physically aggressive now. He says, hang off, thou cat, thou burr, vile thing, let loose. He's struggling to get away from her. Again, who's the victim here? Who's the victimizer? The soul of love, this desire that will pursue, she shall pursue it with the soul of love. That's what's frightening. We can think of all the stalkers who pursue others. Romeo's a stalker. He, he you know, he climbs over Juliet's, uh, you know, the Capulet, uh, into the Capulet garden. He trespasses onto their property and he's spying on Juliet. That's the soul of love. Love, love wants what it wants, and it's going to get what it wants. It will stoop to any means. Uh, sometimes it will. And uh, here, uh, you know, he's telling her to hang off, and again, thou cat. You know, her, her nails are getting into him. He, she's like a cat, like a predatory animal clawing at it. And, you know, he's hurt, and he's worse, thou, thou burr. I mean, she's lower, I mean, she's something without any neurons whatsoever. She's just a nuisance. He wants nothing to do with her. And look what he says next at the top of the page, page 1371, or I will shake thee from me like a serpent. Again, the reptilian image, and we know, you know, our brains are programmed, these serpents, these reptiles, uh, you know, they are dangerous. You know, that's probably why we have this, uh, you know, all these images and, and these, what serpents and things symbolize is probably because of our experience with serpents and snakes and so forth. Uh, the danger that they involve, we have a, a built-in, uh, 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 you know, disgust or fear of them, and here, I mean, she is a kind of reptile, a kind of serpent. Uh, you know, perhaps she's got her arms wrapped around his neck. You could think of a boa constrictor, perhaps. Uh, you know, and uh, this idea that she's a reptile, and she's, oh, mm, oh, you reptile, you serpent. And he's trying to get rid of her here. 
And uh, Helena, when she talks about Hermia, turn to page 1372. I mean, this passage, you can find evidence throughout this passage. This is a, another problem again. We talked about this uh, problem today, the, uh, the sixth uh, problem the lovers are, are up against, and that is this lack of freely choosing, freely desiring. And then this idea that this idea that they do have, you know, here's an idea that linked together closely, this idea that they can't control their desires and that can unleash the beast within. And the animal imagery in the play that uh, appears in the play because of this, I mean, here we see this happening. And uh, you could link, if you wanted to write about two of the problems the lovers confront, this idea of free will is definitely a disturbing problem, particularly for romantics. Uh, but even for, uh, you know, realists, the idea, just the very idea that I, you don't get to choose uh, who you fall in love with. You don't get to choose if you fall out of love with that person. And that can happen any time. And you're just not at, uh, you know, you're just not at the helm of that ship. You're not controlling them, you know. You're not, you're not sailing them waters. You just uh, the ship being tossed on the waves, the waves uh, of your desires, uh, the waves of all these causal factors, many of which you're not aware of, and so this one problem leads to the other. So you, you know you've got a consequence, a, a, a consequence of the first problem, this idea of not being able to freely desire, freely choose, freely make these decisions, and being trapped. Uh, being a mere puppet on a string, uh, uh, the strings of desires. Uh, ooh, there's a good title for the play. Uh, but you could put these two problems, you could connect them together and write about two problems in your essay. These two problems, because I said, remember, if you look at two problems rather than three, there's no magical number. If you look at two, you can explore them in greater depth, but find two problems that are very closely related. Uh, like we did in the last lecture. Uh, remember, we looked at problem four and problem five. You can think of these as reason four and reason five in your essay. And this idea of problem four was this, uh, 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 what was the idea? Now I forget. I got so much in my head going on here. Well, oh yes, this idea that, um, what is it that makes someone worthy of our love? Right? And we tend not to fall, uh, we, most often, I would argue, most people don't fall in love with a person's character. That's a big problem. Because you, you more chances, are, you know, it's, the probabilities are greater that you're going to uh, uh, fall for a jackass. And, uh, and that, of course, is closely linked to this fifth problem. Uh, yeah, the fifth problem we looked at in the last lecture was this idea that we're drawn to the superficial aspects of people. This idea that, uh, 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 you know, we're attracted by their physical appearance or uh, what our culture has told us is important, you know, whether someone has money or power or fame or popularity, that sort of thing. So we're drawn by these trivial aspects uh, that an individual possesses, and uh, that links back to this idea of falling in love. Oh, I remember now, the, the fourth problem was this uh, um, falling in love at first sight. Yes, falling in love at first sight. That was a problem, because we don't tend to fall in love with a person's character, a person's probity, whether that person is sincere, intellectually, and ethical. That's what's of most value because we've arrived at this understanding that pain, suffering, that's where all the evidence, that's where all the proof lies, that is of real value. It is the most important truth, the most important philosophical truth. That's what gives the universe meaning. A universe has to have conscious, sentient beings in it. The little bunny rabbit, one bunny rabbit in the universe gives suddenly now the universe is meaningful because that bunny rabbit can be harmed. It can feel. And suffering is of real value. We know this from our own experience, our own scientific experiments with the world, touching that hot stone. 
We know that. And we see other people and they're reacting and other animals, they're reacting the same way that our brains, their brains are reacting the same way our brains are reacting if they touch a hot stove. So we understand what is of real value. Everybody agrees. All have experienced it. A brain in pain is essentially, intrinsically bad. It's a bad thing. Uh -huh. Yeah, as opposed to projective value. Okay, I don't want to go back there. But at any rate, so these ideas, you know, falling in love at first sight, that's very closely linked to falling in love with the superficial rather than what's important. So that would make an essay. Look at those two reasons, how they're closely linked. And you could even use the evidence we discussed in the last lecture, which was lecture four. And this time you could look at evidence five and evidence six, and you could look at this problem of free will, romantics believing they are free agents, they are in control, they do freely choose, they do freely decide. And we've seen the contradictions, and I just lighted upon this contradiction here in the lecture, didn't I, that if they imagine a grand design or a grand, grand plan that's put in place, it's hard to imagine that they're free to upset that design to go against that supernatural design or plan, particularly if they imagine an all-powerful God that has that plan in place. How are they going to go against that God's design or plan? How can they possibly be free in a world where God already knows who they're going to choose for a soulmate? So you could bring those problems up, and uh, but that problem, the problem of, of the lack of free will uh, in choosing a, a, a partner, a romantic partner, for life, perhaps, that's very closely linked to this idea that, that we're controlled by our desires, many of which we're just not aware of. And we can't help it. We can't help what draws us, attracts us sexually. We can't help how our egos have been shaped, our psychologies, and we know we've evolved to want to be winners. In the particular circumstances, you know, Hermia doesn't want Demetrius, and now it's even more of a challenge for him. Some people react that way because of their programming. Makes them feel even more powerful if they can conquer the one who doesn't want them. If you could conquer Beyonce, if she could desire you. Whew. Wow. Uh, many people think that Beyonce is a goddess. <gasps> Don't they? Yeah. They've been programmed to think that these popular folk, these beautiful folk, they're somehow, that's what's of value. That's what's significant. They have been programmed, right, to be interested in somebody who, well, out there trying to be rational. And trying, you know, somebody who's spending his life like a janitor, going out there and trying to clean up the mess that he himself is making and that other people are making around him. Oh, no, nobody wants to fall in love with that kind of, yeah, no one wants to be with the janitor. All he's doing is harping on the mess all the time, complaining and making arguments. Oh, it's a mess, it's a mess. Oh, no. Uh, no. Beyonce, though, oh, all that pretty bling bling, that popularity, that fame, that wealth, you know, that shape, that form, things base and vile. Our reasoning would tell us something base and vile can, uh, you know, that holds no dignity can suddenly, uh, you know, holding no quantity can suddenly be in love, can transpose it into form and dignity. Now, this is not a personal attack on Beyonce. I don't know her personally. <laughs> she may be rational. And she may be using her fame and popularity. You know, it may be that she's using all of that to do her real work. Who knows? I don't know. My hell, I digress today. But uh, anyway, so these two ideas closely linked. Let me give you one more example. Here, Lysander turned, or two more examples, I think. Helena, uh, on page one, uh, 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 1372, again, act three, scene two, the slap stick scene, slap stick comedy, line three, two, three. Helena tells the men about Hermia, because, you know, Hermia and Helena are now fighting, and these two, by the way, were bosom buddies. They were BBs, bosom buddies, best friends forever, BFF, or, or 
FBB, Facebook buddies. And, uh, and now they are, uh, you know, ready to call each other names. And Hermia is ready to actually attack. When, when Helena keeps calling Hermia names, you know, telling her how little she is, like a, uh, you know, she keeps calling her these names, telling her how short she is. Then Hermia starts calling uh, Helena a beanpole. So you could talk about the verbal abuse in this scene too, but the physical abuse as well. And here, look what Helena says about Hermia, formerly her BFF, her best friend forever. She says, look out, gentlemen, right? She, that's what she's telling Lysander Demetrius. And she says so at line 323, uh, page 1372. Oh, when she is angry, she is keen and shrewd. Again, that idea of being keen and shrewd. Human beings have this ability to be keen and shrewd. They have their ability to use their intelligence to plot and plan in their own interest, in their own gain, their own personal needs. That's what I mean. That's the difference in intelligence. Intellectual intelligence tells you you don't do that. You don't offer, you're not in the world to try to cheat people, to lie and cheat people so that you can personally gain something. No, that's not using, that's, that's using your intelligence, that's debasing your, your ability to use your intelligence in the right way. Because again, you're understanding, you're un, not understanding one plus one equals two. And look what Helen is saying, she is keen and shrewd. She was a vixen when she went to school. And a vixen, of course, a female fox. And again, the fox is keen and shrewd, but the fox doesn't know it's being keen and shrewd. The fox doesn't say, oh, I'm hanging out here by the chicken coop. Look how keen and shrewd I'm being. I'm gonna wait till it gets dark, till nighttime. Then I'm gonna sneak in quietly, tippy toe, into the hen house keenly and shrewdly. No, the female, the vixen, the female fox ain't thinking like that. Not enough neurons up there in her head. This is just how she has evolved. She has been programmed through evolution. This is what worked for her ancestors. The ones who behaved this way, they got the chickens. Horrible, isn't it? Ate them alive. I told you, evolution just ugly. This is not Mother Nature. But her ancestors who didn't act this way, who made too much noise on the way to the chicken coop, well, they got gobbled up by some other animal that heard them making that noise. So only the ancestors that had evolved, maybe with, I don't know, lighter feet, I don't know. I, I haven't studied that much about animals. It's just too horrible for me to go look at, confront. But I don't know, there might be something about the fox's physical self that it, it evolved to actually move a certain stealthy way and a lighter way. You know, cats can jump high and they can move quickly. And all of these tools that they have, these aren't tools that we humans have. The claws and the ability to be very, very quiet. I mean, we're klutzes. We make a lot of noise. That firework display last night, we're like the busy eggs out there making noise. But the, you know, these other, they have other t tools that evolved uh, that uh, uh, enabled them to escape pain and harm. And so they're, uh, you know, they uh, were able to procreate before they were brutally killed. And then that ability, you know, uh, 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 evolution, all it does is make lots and lots, thousands of copies. And sometimes one of those copies comes out slightly different. It's a mutation, it's an error in the code, in the DNA molecule, in the code. There's a slight error, something slightly different. And just by coincidence, that slight difference, maybe a one animal is born that's a little bit quicker. That slight difference gives it an advantage. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's wiped out, it doesn't do any good. But sometimes it does. So the vixen doesn't know it's being keen and shrewd. But Hermia, according to Helena, she's keen and shrewd. 
Humans ought to know better. That's not how you use your intelligence, to be keen and shrewd and to act like a vixen, a predator, to seek your prey, gobble them up. No, human beings don't act that way. And Helen is accusing Hermia of being something less than human, of being animalistic, a beast, a brute, a predator. And so you see this all throughout this scene. Um, one more, and only because 1372 Lysander again to Hermia. Look what he says to her just a few lines down at line, uh, oh, I didn't mark, yeah, uh, at line 327. He tells Hermia again, get you gone, you dwarf. Now he's picked up the language that Helena is using. Helena is calling Hermia, you know, a dwarf. She's so short. That he's, you know, it's a term even in those days that was used to put people down, a dwarf. We don't use that term anymore, uh, do we? Um, but he's picked up Helena's language. His brain has heard this. Maybe he's picked it up because, you know, he wants to show Helena that he agrees with Helena. He loves Helena. He wants to impress Helena that he's in agreement with her. Uh, yeah. And he says, you minimus of hindering not grass made, you bead you acorn. Again, this is even lower than, than the reptiles, lower than the worms, lower than the insects. These are things that have zero intelligence. These are things, right? I mean, plants are complex multicellular organisms, but they don't have a brain. Weeds don't have a brain. So uh, they're, they're not conscious, they can't feel. Some people think brain, uh, that plants can feel. No, you're just, people are just anthropomorphizing you know, brains into thinking that they can feel like human beings can. Because a brain would have no reason to evolve uh, to, uh, uh, to have this uh, a brain that is basically a tool, uh, a mechanical device of reward and punishment. It's a reward and punishment system, operating system. And a plant would have no need to have a brain because what's it gonna do? There's no way it can escape harm. I mean, if it's caught on fire, you know, a forest fire, if a forest fire, if the pine tree's caught on fire, the pine tree can't escape. It can't say, oh, I'm in pain, I better run. No. So plants can't feel. Uh, uh, you know, they're, they're just, uh, they're robots too, as well as we are, but they're just, they're more like computers in that sense, that they just react chemically to the environment. And that's what they're doing, but they don't have brains, they're not conscious, they can't feel, because there'd be no reason. What, to, if they were to have a brain, imagine the horror, being on fire, you can't at least try to fall over and roll, you know, roll in the grass. They can't do that. Here comes the lawnmower. Those blades of grass are going, ah, here comes a lawnmower, pain. We're going to all be beheaded. We better run. You know, imagine, you know, the dandelion. I'm just a dandelion. I'm afraid of my lawnmowers. Here comes the lawnmower. It's going to chop off my dandelion head. Oh, I better run. I better run. I better hide. No, I can't do that. It doesn't have a brain. It's not aware. It can't feel because it couldn't do anything. If it had a brain, oh my, imagine the horror. <laughs> Seeing the lawnmower blades coming towards you and there ain't nothing you do, you can't even scream out, stop! But at any rate. So Lysander, this final image here, Hermia has been reduced to this uh, 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 thing without a brain. That's what she's been reduced to. So this verbal abuse, this aggressive abuse, this bestial behavior we see here. Again, you could uh, think about this in writing your essay. It is the, uh, I'm trying to count now, four, five, seventh problem. So you get a little problem six and seven that we've lectured on today. And we're gonna explore this bestial image a little bit more today. I mean, I got some time left. Hang in there. You can pause it if you want. You've got that option. You can get away for a while. 
you can run to mama or daddy or your BFF and say, I'm praying. And they're going to say, what do you mean? All right, I shall return. I'll be back. As Arno says, Arno is the terminator. I'm a kind of terminator here, Arno. I'm, I'm terminating the romantic viewpoint and the comic plot line. I'm the terminator. And I'll be back. And I'm back. Um, before we uh, leave Act 3 today, let's talk about one more concept on your midterm exam and we'll turn to act four in the next lecture it looks as if i'll have to do i'll have to make uh, two more lectures uh, but at any rate let's leave act three by thinking about this problem known as the problems of personal identity and this too is a concept that shakespeare explores in his play he uh it brings us back to this question, doesn't it? Who are you? Let's analyze that idea. Just who are you? Who are you? Remember, romantics, they have this, this notion. They use that expression all the time, don't they? Everybody says it. I love you. Well, we've seen Shakespeare challenge this idea of love what they really mean by love. But this idea of an I and a you, think of those words in quotation marks. What is the I? What is the you? And romantics, as I said, they tend to think that this I and this you, what we call a personal identity, who you are, who I am, that is fixed. It doesn't change. It's stable. It lasts over time and it doesn't in any way alter no matter what the situation no matter what the place it doesn't change it's fixed lovers have great confidence in this notion of it's a true love i love you and i love you forever baby this idea of forever it won't change my love for you that's this idea that romantics, this view they hold in their head. Remember romantics, uh, they believe uh, there's something beyond the physical body, something spiritual, a soul perhaps, a spirit, some sort of aura that isn't subject to the physical, the physical realities around us. And of course, the realist is going to say, no, this, this uh, question, who are you? I've said it before, you are your brain. It's you brain. It's Mr. Starkey brain. That's who we are. This physical thing, the brain. And so of course, the brain being physical will change. It will change over time and it does it began, right, depending on the situation you find yourself in, depending on the circumstances, what's going on around you, the brain looking for those problems, trying to resolve those problems in this new environment. So it too, it's going to change. Your personal identity will change. It will change in time and it will change depending on the situation. It will change over time and it will change depending on the situation you find yourself in and the circumstances, what's going on, the environment, all of that. All of that's going to have an impact on your brain. And so the realist says there is no stable or fixed or unchanging you. You're constantly changing. Always. Depending on that, the time. Depending on the place, depending on the circumstances, depending on your experiences. Uh, this idea of the soul that the romantic, most romantics subscribe to, there's a problem again. We know the problem, this supernatural entity. I mean, just what is a soul? A definition problem. We always start with a definition and nobody, no romantic seems to have a definition that makes any sense. 
You can't just say it's non-physical. It's a non-physical entity, some non-physical thing, because that doesn't explain it. That just leaves the myth. That just closes the door to one mystery and opens it up to another. Well, it never really closes the door to the first mystery, does it? It just leaves it this mysterious something or other. It doesn't give us any idea what it is, this soul or this spirit. And where does it originate? Did it just poof into existence? Remember, again, the realist says, we know what you are. That we know what your origins are. You, uh, you know, uh, you began as this egg and this sperm. And long before that, uh, you can find your beginnings, trace them all the, way, all the way back to these energy bits and these matter bits. That's what you are. Your, your brain is mostly empty space. Mostly empty space. Mostly, mostly nothing. But... It's also, uh, uh, other than this nothing, it's these energy bits and these matter bits that uh, evolve and, and uh, become these more complex arrangements. Uh, you know, the chemicals and uh, uh, finally the cells. And, uh, and we, you know, we evolve. We, we evolve. That explains our origins. And it's all physical stuff. All physical. So, uh, also with this idea, this concept of the soul, remember, um, we don't know how to define it. Nobody knows how to define it. No romantic can really give us a, a clear understanding of what it is. And nobody, no romantic can explain its origins. Or a, a third problem again is just how does this non-physical thing interact with the brain, with the body? It's non-physical. How could it possibly interact? There are no like properties between the non-physical and the physical. There's another mystery. So just how does it interact with the brain, with the physical body, with the physical brain? Uh, and where's this evidence? There's no evidence other than this desire, this want, or this need that many people have Nobody likes this idea that when their brain dies, they, poof, vanish, they're gone. Well, actually, you know, we break down. You know, we become, once again, atoms and uh, uh, take on, we shapeshift into different uh, forms, don't we? Uh, but it, these are physical forms we are shapeshifting into. And uh, there's another problem. If, if you do posit that the soul is something, uh, that that's what, that's who you are, that's your personal identity, and that's fixed, it doesn't change, it's stable. That's why I can say as a romantic, I love you forever. My love is true, it will never change. Because my soul, we are soulmates, and our souls will be constant, they will be faithful. They will be faithful not only in this world, but in the world beyond. Remember, super romantics, many of them, most of them, believe in this supernatural realm, this happily ever after place. And there too, their love will remain constant and true. It's a true love. And it will, it's, uh, you know, it can stand the test of time. And it can stand all kinds of various circumstances and situations. And this other problem is, well, how can we tell uh, if, if the soul corresponds to the body? I mean, uh, let's take uh, some soda pop. Let's take Mountain Dew. Yahoo, Mountain Dew. That was my favorite drink growing up. Uh, Yahoo, a Mountain Dew. It says Mountain Dew on the label, on the bottle. Mountain Dew. But how do I know that the liquid inside, the beverage inside, is really Mountain Dew? Well, I got to test it scientifically. I got to pop off the cap to the bottle and I gotta take a swig of that Mountain Dew. And then I say, ah yes, that's Mountain Dew. So what it says on the outside corresponds to what's on the inside. But now, just how can I determine, you know, if I have a honey bunny, how can I determine that the soul honey bunny has corresponds to the body? Hmm, that's a problem. I can't open up Honey Bunny's head and look inside and say, ah, 
It's Honey Bunny's soul. Look. That soul, that thing that's fixed and stable, never changing, there it is inside the body. Now I know. How can I possibly do that? That's a real problem. I mean, for all we know, maybe uh, souls change from one body to another. I mean, after all, how are you going to falsify that once you start believing in things like souls? Maybe uh, I'm with Honey Bunny and Honey Bunny's got somebody else's soul. I just have Honey Bunny's body, but somebody else's soul is inside of Honey Bunny. Oh boy. Maybe you have Honey Bunny and my soul is inside of Honey Bunny. Maybe we switched. There's a frightening thought. So yeah, there's a problem. First of all, with the, with the first response, well, what are you? Who are you? Uh, what is this fixed, stable thing you call an identity? What is your personal identity? Uh, this soul, this spirit, positing that as an explanation. Oh, there's that God of the gaps yet. Uh, that God, that supernatural explanation, trying to explain, fill in the gap of our knowledge. The God of the gaps. Uh, we just get the God of the gap. We just cannot fill in that uh, that gap with a supernatural explanation. Now we got a gap the size of the Grand Canyon. It's a Grand Canyon. This now is the, the supernatural explanation trying to fill a Grand Canyon of mysteries. It's just not gonna work. Well, maybe you're your body. Maybe that's what you are. That's your personal identity. But no, that can't be because your body changes over time. It's not fixed, it's not stable, it's not permanent. No. Get out your family scrapbook, if you don't believe me. There's the proof. Look back five years. There you are. Five years ago, that's what you look like. Go back ten years. Go back and look at some of your baby pictures. No. Uh-uh, that isn't you. We could probably start... Oh, here's a... A rather a macabre thought. We can start removing pieces of your body. Let's do that. Let's take off an arm here and a leg there and an ear here and a, I don't know. Remove your nose too and we'll pop both your eyes out. Well, no. That's no, that can't be you because you're still you, aren't you? You're still you, even though you don't have all of these, uh, you know, body parts. So it can't be the body. You are your brain. The realist says that's who you are. You are your brain. And your brain, being this physical thing, is constantly changing. Uh, this mechanical device, this tool, is constantly taking in new data, new experiences. So over time, you're changing. Um, think about it. Before this lecture began, you were somebody else. Your personal identity. I mean, there's a slight change, but a lot of new ideas, new concepts have had an impact on you since this lecture began almost three hours ago. And so, man, you know, you've changed to some extent. Maybe you've changed a great deal. Maybe a lot of these concepts have, wow, maybe they've had quite an impact on you. Maybe just a little bit. But the you of three hours ago, that's a different person. Your identity's changed, even if only slightly. It's changed. You're not the same person when you sat down in front of the laptop and pulled up this video that you were three hours ago. You can think of that person as a very close ancestor of yours, that three hour ago person. That's a very close ancestor of yours, direct ancestor. Uh, we'll go back to yesterday. Well, there's an ancestor. A little bit, oh, you've had a lot of experiences, more experiences than within the last three hours since yesterday. Again, the impacts may not have been particularly great. You may have actually changed more in three hours than you did over the last three days, let's say. Go back three years. You can see the more time that passes, the more opportunity, the more chance for you to change. For your brain to collect this new information, this new data, these new experiences. I mean, you're always, your brain's always the scientist out in the world. 
It's always observing, always collecting information. And you put some of that information together, you've added it up, you've, come, you've arrived at new truths perhaps over time. So, yeah, I mean, you've changed quite a bit. Uh, let's think about the moon. And uh, because the moon is an important symbol in this play, isn't it? Well, let's use the moon then as an analogy. Think about a new moon. Uh, 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 a new moon. That's what you are when you're born. Remember the new moon? It's, it will imagine it in the sky. And let's, let's imagine a newborn moon, the first new moon. Well, that moon's got a nice, smooth surface on it. That's you when you're born. You've got a little bit of genetics in there already, programmed, but no experiences. And then those experiences start to have an impact on your brain. That brain, that smooth surface of the moon, that's your brain. And then, you know, sometimes it's, a, it's a, a, an asteroid that hits that surface of your brain, the surface of that smooth moon. Sometimes it's a comet. Sometimes it's a, a, a meteor. Sometimes a meteorite. Sometimes it's just a little bit of comic debris. But all those, that cosmic, all that cosmic uh, stuff in the universe that's impacting your brain, your, the smooth surface of your moon, is changing your identity. Constantly changing your identity, isn't it? Developing these craters, and these deserts, and these valleys, these mountains on the moon. And that's what shapes you over time, these experiences. Like the moon, the new moon. It, it, you can think of the, the, the new moon as this smooth, smooth, uh, uh, a new satellite, a newborn satellite. And that's you when you're born, and that's what happens to you over time. So you're changing this personality of yours. And your personality can also change depending on the place you find yourself in at the moment, the situation, the environment you find yourself in. Um, again, think of the moon. The moon, depending on where it is in relationship to the earth, is constantly changing, isn't it? Depending on the situation, the, the place in space and uh, the circumstances, right? The relationship. And that's you. Where are you? Where are you? Where, where, what, what new environment are you in now? You move position, you're constantly moving about like the moon's constantly moving about. And we know the moon, we see it. Sometimes it is a new moon, we can't see it in the sky. Sometimes it's a crescent moon, a quarter moon. And then it becomes a full moon. It waxes, right? From the new moon to the half moon. So it becomes a half moon and then it begins to wane. It becomes once again a, 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 a well it becomes a, a quarter moon, a, what, what, a half moon, and then it becomes a three quarter moon, and then it becomes a full moon. So it's constantly changing depending on where it is in space here, its environment in relationship to the earth. And then it begins to wane. The full moon changes to the Three quarter moon, the three quarter to the uh, 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 no full yeah that's right is that right I don't know but you get the idea the quarter moon the full moon the three quarter the one quarter and then you have the new moon again but it's really not the same new moon as before is it because now the Earth and the Moon are in different place with relationship to the Sun and the Sun is in a different place in relationship to the Milky Way galaxy. And the Milky Way galaxy is in a different place in space with relationship to all the other galaxies, with relationship to the very universe itself. So it's never the same new moon, the same quarter moon, the same three quarter moon, the same half moon, it's never none of that. None of it at all, just ain't. Constantly changing. And you do the same thing depending on where you are, what's going on, what environment you find yourself in, you're constantly changing. Just who are you if you're changing so much? Remember the romantic thinks something's fixed about you, something's stable. You may have this idea that, yeah, I'm permanent. I am me. I am what I am. That's who I am. But no, think about it. When you're in the classroom at the community college, you're putting on an act, a role. You're a student. You behave a certain way in the classroom. 
Is that the real you, the student you? Or what about when you go to work? You're at work. Let's say you're dealing with customers and you've got a boss. Is that the real you? That's slightly different from the student you, isn't it? What about your, when you're at home at the family supper table with mom and daddy? Ah, is that the real you? Hmm. What about after supper when you want to get away from mom and daddy and go with your friends? Yeah, you want to hang out with your friends. Now there's the real you, out with your friends. That's you, right? Wait a minute, what if you and friends go clubbing and you have a little too much uh, blue moon? You know that beer called blue moon? Let's stick with this idea of blue moon, or the idea of a moon. I like that analogy, blue moon. Maybe you've had a few too many blue moons and now you're a little bit tipsy, a little bit drunk even. Maybe you're just plastered. Is that the real you? Well, you say, no, I'm just drunk. That's the temporary me, but some people stay drunk. Have they become a new person? Have they? And maybe afterwards, after you leave the bar, you go out, I don't know. I'm not saying you, of course, but who knows? Maybe you smoke a little marijuana. Now, I know it's illegal. It is illegal in this state still. Uh, so if I catch you <laughs> smoking that marriage you want, I'm going to have to make a citizen's arrest. But yeah, is that the real you? And you say, no, I'm just temporarily, you know, influenced by the drugs. But some people, they light up and they get addicted and they're known as potheads. Have they become this pothead? Is that the real, is that the real you? It's interesting, isn't it? All these different places you go. What about when you become sick? I know when I get sick, I get real crabby. I'm a crab apple. Is that the real me? What if I were to remain sick? What if my illness is chronic? It's just never going to go away. Have I changed suddenly and now I'm the crab apple? Hmm. I just don't know. What about your emotions? When you get angry, when you get sad, when you get happy, when you get fearful, Possibly changing your identity depending on the situation, the circumstance. Yeah. What about when you go to sleep at night and dream? Where do you go? What about in these states of unconsciousness when you sleep? You know, these deep states where you're not dreaming. Where have you gone? Did you just poof and disappear? And then when you do begin to dream, are you the you in your dreams? What if you develop Alzheimer's? What happens to you? If you got a soul or a spirit, why don't you remain you? That can't be affected by Alzheimer's disease. But the brain can. Is that the new you? What about if you suffer from a brain tumor? I'm always reminded of this, uh, this man, I can't think of his name, but it happened back in the 60s, late 60s, early 70s. And um, he uh, actually uh, uh, took a shotgun and uh, he killed his wife and his mother and then climbed to the top of a tower at a, a campus in Texas. I forget the name of the campus. You'll have to look this up. And he began firing on the people on the campus. Uh, campus. He killed a lot of them. And what was strange is, he left a note. Afterwards, he killed himself. And he left a note. And in the note, it said that he wanted the doctors to do an autopsy on his brain because he thought something was wrong with his brain. And they did an autopsy on him. They found a large tumor pressing on some part of the brain. I think it was the amygdala that controls our impulses. What if your brain develops a tumor? Is that you? How could a tumor affect a spirit or a soul? It's tough to imagine, isn't it? What about a serious brain trauma? What about a brain death? Serious trauma, serious deaths. People can change completely from serious brain traumas. You won't even recognize them as that the new person? Just who are you? And of course, for our lovers, under the influence of the sexual hormones, 
what happens to them? They change too, don't they? Just who are you? It's interesting. There was a, uh, I put a little note here, there was a, a game show in the 60s called To Tell the Truth. And someone, a, a mystery guest star would come on and people would be blindfolded and they were supposed to guess who that person was. They were given clues and that person disguised his or her voice. And I, yeah, we could extend that idea. Will the real you, who are you? Tell the truth there. Are you someone who's going to remain faithful and constant? Is there such a thing as true love that will last and endure? How can it if you change over time? The I changes, the you changes, I love you forever. But this I and this you, these individual personalities, they're constantly in flux. They're not stable, they're not rooted, they're not fixed. You know it from your own experiences. You're different. You're different over time. You change. You're different depending on where you are, the location you find yourself in, the environment, the people around you. You begin to play a role. Some of those roles can become permanent. I've been teaching, what, 30, 40? Oh, my. I've been teaching since, oh, I don't know. It goes way back. I don't know, it's too frightening to contemplate. But I don't know, maybe I've just become this you, the teacher. But no, that can't be true. I'm one person in the classroom, but I'm somebody else outside the classroom. You don't know who I am outside the classroom, do you? No, you just don't know. Who are you? Who am I? And that's a question Shakespeare has. Remember Julia in Romeo and Julia. When Romeo says, I wish, I'll swear to you, I swear by the moon, I'll love you forever, baby. And Julia says, don't you dare, don't you dare swear by that moon. That moon, oh, swear not by the moon. That, uh, that uh, monthly changes in her circle orb. Monthly she changes in her circle orb. Lest your love likewise prove variable, uh, lest your love change like the moon changes. So don't swear to me your true love by the moon. That's what she said. She's serious. Don't swear by the moon. She says, swear by yourself. But what is this self? Myself, yourself, herself, himself, themselves? What is this thing called a self? Remember, if you're not of a religious nature, you might subscribe to this idea of a self, which again is some supernatural, something separate from the body. Consciousness, the self, something mysterious, non-physical, separate from the body. You're gonna have the same problems you found with the soul. Those questions are gonna arise, and you're just gonna open the door to more mysteries, and all those doors, all those side doors to science, and all those doors, the you know, doors to philosophy, you're going to hear them slamming shut the bolts. Yeah, you're just not going to have an explanation. You're just going to end up with more mysteries. You really are. You're going to get swallowed up in that Grand Canyon, the gap, that Grand Canyon gap. You're going to disappear. So, yeah, this is a problem. This is another problem that you could explore in your essay this problem of the personal identity because romantics believe in true love, that they will never change their feelings toward their honey bunnies, their sweetie pies, their precious babies. They're never going to change. Nothing, no matter what. I will love you till the day I die, till death do us part. And then I will love you. Some of them think I will love you in a happily ever after magical kingdom, Disney World in the sky. I like there. Uh, how exciting it will be with Mickey Mouse and Tinkerbell and all those other supernatural beings. Mickey Mouse, Tinkerbell, Peter Pan. You know. So... Yeah, this is a problem. And Shakespeare points this out to us. Let's go back in our text, Act 3, Scene 2. And Lysander and Hermia, you know, this is the slapstick, slap, blah, 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 slapstick comedy scene. And uh, there's 
quite many disturbing elements here in Shakespeare, this idea of metamorphosis, of translation. Shakespeare likes to use the word translation for this idea of shape-shifting, of changing, this theme uh, that nothing is fixed or stable, including our identities. This theme runs throughout the play. This would make a good topic for your essay. Explore this notion of the shape-shifter. Puck, remember, is a shape-shifter. The Amazons, they're shape-shifters too, aren't they? Yeah, everyone's constantly changing. Bottom is literally translated. Remember, when Quince first sees Bottom after Puck has played his prank and Bottom has the head of a jackass, Quince says, oh, oh, bless me, Bottom, thou art translated. This word translated, metamorphosed into something I don't recognize. You're no longer Bottom. So Bottom undergoes a literal transformation. The lovers, however, undergo a figurative transformation, don't they? Look what Hermia says here in the text. Uh, Act 3, Scene 2, line 271. Lysander says, uh, he's talking to Demetrius, and he says, although he hates Hermia, he's not going to harm her. And when she hears this, she says, what? Can you do me greater harm than hate? Hate me? Now, I'm going to read this passage, and I'm going to emphasize all the pronouns in the passage just to get this point across, this idea of the problem of a fixed personal identity, the I, the you, the me. There's nothing fixed or stable. She can't imagine that he's changed, and now he hates her. This can't be Lysander. We know he's under the influence, the sexual hormones. But she doesn't understand. What can you do me? Greater harm than hate? Hate me? Wherefore, O oh me, what news, my love? Am not I, Hermia? Are not you, Lysander? I am as fair now as I was erewhile. Since night you loved me, yet since night you left me. Why then you left me? Oh, but God's forbid, in earnest shall I say. Just who are you, Lysander? You're not you anymore. And what are you seeing in me? You're not seeing me anymore. I am still Hermia. I haven't changed. Yes, she has. She has changed. The irony here is she's become the former Helena. Not literally, but figuratively. At the beginning of the play, Demetrius Lysander, they didn't want Helena. They didn't, neither one cared about Helena. And here in this passage in Act 3, Scene 2, these guys, they don't want to have anything to do with Hermia. They both love Helena now. Before, they didn't care about Helena. Now, they worship her. Before, both men wanted Hermia. Now they want Helena. Helena's changed too. Helena's become Hermia. And this is exactly what Helena wanted, isn't it? Her wish has come true. The irony is she doesn't believe it. Look, turn back. Act 1, scene 1. Go all the way back. We're going back. Act 1, scene 1. At the bottom of the page here. Ah, uh, yeah. Line 190. Here's the irony. Look what Helena tells Hermia. Remember, Helena is jealous of Hermia because Demetrius loves Hermia, not Helena. Demetrius used to love Helena. And so now, Helena, look what she says to Hermia. And again, I'm at line 190, Act 1, Scene 1, and I'm on page, uh, what page is this? 1343. Three. Look what she says. Were the world mine, this is what Helena is telling Hermia, if I had the whole world in my hands, were the world mine, Demetrius being baited, with the exception of Demetrius, save Demetrius, if I had the whole world in my hands, were the world mine, Demetrius being baited, the rest I'd give to you. The rest I give to be 
to you translated. I'd give the rest, I'd give the whole world away. The rest I'd give to be to you translated. I'd give the whole world, except Demetrius, of course, because Demetrius is more important to her than the whole world. She'd give everything else, all the world away, if she could just become Hermia. If she could be translated into Hermia. She's not saying, I want to be like you, Hermia. I want to be you. She's longing for a kind of figure to death here, isn't she? Or maybe, oh, I don't see how it could be a literal death, a figure to death. She won't, doesn't want to be Helen anymore. She wants to be Hermia. And she has undergone that figure to death here in Act 3, Scene 2. She's become Hermia because now both men want her. Lysander wanted Hermia in the beginning of the play, and so does, did Demetrius. And now both men want Helena. Helena's become Hermia. She's been translated. She's metamorphosed. All because of this new situation. All because of the hormones. The magical flower juice. There's no mystery going on here. It's the sexual hormones. Their love, these men's love, it's not stable. It's not fixed. The hormones have kicked in at that moment when there was Helena before then. And suddenly they desired Helena. This love that Lysander professed would last forever. Remember, Lysander believed in true love. Ah, where's it gone? Where's Lysander gone? Hermie just can't understand. Who are you? What's happened to you? And what about the men? What about the young boys? They've changed too. Demetrius, in the beginning, he loved Hermia, desired Hermia. And then he switched and wanted Helena. His identity's not fixed, and now he wants. Uh, 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 no, in the beginning he loved Helena. Boy, you got to keep this straight. Before the play began, he loved Helena. When the play begins, he loves Hermia, and now he loves Helena again. These hormones causing him to change. And of course, a lot of this could be ego, too. We can speculate. Lysander's after Hermia. Lysander loves Hermia in the beginning. Maybe Demetrius, you know, he wants to compete. He wants to be the alpha male, uh, you know, in relationship to Lysander. But Demetrius has been translated. He's become the former Demetrius, the Demetrius before the play even began, who loved Helena. Now, in Act 3, Scene 2, the slapstick comedy scene, once again, he loves Helena. She doesn't believe it. The problem of the other mind, the irony here, she's become Hermia in a sense, in a figurative sense. And she's got, she's Hermia and she's got what she wants. Demetrius wants her, but she doesn't believe him. And irony upon the layers of irony you can see in this scene. It just boggles the mind, doesn't it? And Lysander as well. Lysander has become the former Demetrius, the Demetrius before the play even began, the Demetrius who longed for Helena. Now Lysander longs for Helena. Lysander wanted Hermia, now he wants Helena. He's become the former Demetrius who, before the play began, desired Helena. These young lovers, they have no fixed identities. It's constantly changing their personal identities. They're not stable. They alter depending on what's going on, the circumstances, the situation, the experiences that they're undergoing, the influences, both the external influence, the internal influence, those sexual hormones. Remember what the magical flower juice is representing. It's not representing the romantic view, love is a mystery. Here's one more piece of evidence to show that's not it at all. If this falling in love were a mystery, and if that's what the magical flower juice represented, then these lovers would remain true to each other. But no. The magical flower juice, this juice represents the hormones. It represents these hormones in the brain. This chemical concoction. It's cooking. The cooking chemical concoction in the brain. And all these lovers have changed. I mean, you could tease this problem out 
even further if you wanted to. I mean, there is an actor on the stage playing Hermia. So the actor, who is he? Because it's a boy. Remember in Shakespeare's day, boys played girls on the stage. Women weren't allowed to be actors. Women didn't have any power, any rights. So boys played the female parts. So there's a boy playing a girl. He's playing Hermia, an actor, playing the character of Hermia. And Hermia has been translated into Helen. <gasps> oh no. Just who is this person on the stage? Is it the actor? Uh, uh, if it's a method actor, remember method actors, the method is that you actually become the character you're playing. You don't just pretend the emotions, you experience them for real, right? Method actors, there's a method to great acting, they argue. And it's about becoming the actor. And what does that mean? Not just pretending to cry, but really crying, really feeling that emotion that causes one to cry, experiencing that as if you actually were, you had been translated into that character. So who is this actor on the stage? Is it the actor pretending, playing a role? If it's a method actor, has he now become the character on the stage? Because he's actually uh, changed his identity? And if the actor, uh, the character on the stage, his identity has been translated, I mean, I mean, you could just see, we can get lost in this maze of who are you? This is a real problem for these lovers, for these romantic lovers. They just can't understand all this mayhem, all this confusion, this fickleness, this changeability that we see going on here in the play. Uh, you know. And of course, they're all too under the influence of the drug. Remember, they're all now behaving like animals. Is this the real you? Think about it, those times when the animal in you gets loose. Is, it, is that the real you or is the civilized, is it you the civilized you or are you just the civilized you because society's got you on a tight leash? Which one is it? Who would you become if you could suddenly become the invisible man? Who would you become then? Nobody could see you, nobody could know what she's up to. Who might you become then? Hmm. Interesting. And we're going to turn to Act 4. We're going to go deeper into the woods where things get even darker and more frightening because we're going to return to Titania's bower. And we know that Titania, she's no longer alone in her bower. She has dragged bottom back. She's dragged her jackass back to that bower and she's tied him up and gagged him. She's forced him back there. Yeah, he just wanted to get out of the woods, but no, she is a fairy of no common right. She has forcibly dragged him back against his desire. She's trying to even bribe him a little bit. We're going back to her bower where things are gonna get really, really dark really, really frightening when it comes to this notion of personal identity. You think about that, we'll leave you in suspense. In the next lecture, we will turn to Act 4. I'll put that online tomorrow and Tuesday. I am determined, oh dear, those best laid plans, but I am determined to get the last act done on Tuesday. But until then, hmm, tonight when you Lay your head on your pillow when you lie back. Look deep inside yourself. See if you can find 